Welcome back to Skarn, a land fraught with peril, adventure, and most of all, change. Around every corner lies a forgotten civilization. Behind every tale of adventure lies a journey fraught with temptation. Scratching the surface usually leads to breaking the veil between this era and the last. And those who look to fill in the edges of the map usually don't come back. This is a world where if one is willing, you can become famous or a hero or just as easily be forgotten. A world where every gamble has the odds against you and the punishment is final, death. But the reward, your heart's desires. What would you do with endless opportunity and adventurer's spirit? We look to our players, heroes already in their own rights, to see how they plan to continue their legends. I bid thee greetings, redeemed and divine races, titan spawn and ancient ones. I am Patrick, known by the whisper on the sea breeze and in the hearts of dragons as Patty Shakes underscore. And I am the game master for this story. This is session zero of our continuing campaign, Draco Genesis, season two, A Flight of Whimsy, taking place in Scarred Lands, a setting published by Onyx Path Publishing. This is an awesome adventure brought to you by Vorpal Tales. You can find Vorpal Tales on lots of places on the internet. Of course, we are on Twitch right here, right now. Consider giving us a follow or subscribe. Check out all of our social medias, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, at Vorpal Tales, where you can get updates about the cast and our goings-ons. A website, vorpaltales.com, where you can get links to our affiliates and see our up-to-date calendars. A Patreon and a Ko-Fi. Ko-Fi? Ko-Fi? I don't know. Where if, you, where if you feel so inclined, you can toss a coin to us in order to make more, better, and Vorpal Tale your content. I would like to thank Onyx Path Publishing for making an incredible world and setting to use to amaze and delight. Also to Astral Tabletop for bringing our virtual tabletop where we can see the baddies who look to waylay our heroes and get that sweet, sweet ambiance. Speaking of, a thank you goes to Vinswept, a wonderful YouTube channel that has amazing music to set your adventure to. Additionally, Vorpal Tales has some fantastic sponsors we'd love to tell you about. First is QUEmpire.com, a small company making original dice and products for your favorite RPGs and card games. Use code VORPALTALES for 10% off. Next is Hit Point Press, known for their various reference cards, but also for creating the Humblewood and Hecta campaign settings. Visit VORPALTALES.com, click on our affiliate link, and anything you purchase, a portion of it will benefit the show. And finally is Gem Hammer and Sons, an RPG supplement store that has everything from Decks of Wonder to Decks of Illusion to Dice. Once again, use the discount code Warple Tales for 10% off. And now, dear viewers, meet our intrepid adventurers who look to sail, slay, search, seduce, and shift their, the very core of Skarn. Please state your name, where people can find you on the internet, and who you'll be playing tonight. Hello, everybody. I am Steve. My pronouns are he, him. You can find me on the internet at Voodoo Arcade. And tonight I am playing the Malfoon, the Drindali Elf. It's good to be back. Indeed it is. And I am John, otherwise known as J3Billion, on the interwebs. And I will be playing Devok, our Eldritch Knight. Friends, my name is Beatrice, but you can call me Birdie. I'll be playing Seeker Pajat, a doctor, here to help in any way they can, for a price. Ooh, I like that. Hi, friends. My name is Keems, and you can find me on the interwebs at It's Be Keems. Tonight, I'll be playing Sayana, the Death Domain Cleric, and Halloweenaire. Hey everybody, I'm Ever. My pronouns are they, them, and you can find me all over the internet as Changeling Ever. Tonight I am returning to the character Yinei, whose pronouns I think they figured out are they, them now. So we'll see how that goes. Hey y'all, uh, it's me, Devin. You can find me online at Sword of Sully, and tonight I am returning as Gar, the Redemption of Paladin. Deal with all of these people killing them. <laughs> Alrighty. Thank you very much, adventurers. Well, now that we've met everyone, briefly at least, 
I know it's been a little while since we've been to the world of Skarn, so allow me to reintroduce you to this wonderful world that you are in. Welcome to Skarn. This world is not what it once was. Broken and battered, it was mauled in a great conflict that raised across its surface for years. The Titans, primal beings, forces of nature that created and shaped Skarn, warred with their children, the gods, who had learned to draw power from the faith of lowly mortals wandering the face of Skarn. They clashed across the world, amassing armies using the creatures they created or who worshiped them. On one side were the Titan spawn, twisted monsters and foul creatures loyal to the Titans. On the other, the divine races, the mortals, banded together to aid the gods. Over time, the gods were successful and the Titans subdued, but never destroyed. The gods are the sole rulers of Skarn now, fueled by the devout worship of their mortal followers. Yet though the war is over, the damage remains. And it, is, and it is for this reason that Skarn is now known as the Scarred Lands. That great conflict, known as both the Divine War and the Titans War, has been over for a century and a half, but the healing process has only just begun. Much of Skarn's topography has been twisted and warped in unnatural ways, and the Titans, though dormant, are not dead. Yet hope remains. Though it is not the largest, Gelspad is the most populous continent of Skarn. Because of its dense population, this continent bore the brunt of the Titans' attacks on the armies of the gods. Much of its landscape shifted during the Divine War. For dance savannas were smashed into obsolete and desolate wastelands, and magnificent forests shriveled to lonely stands of blighted trees. Large portions of the land still crawl with titan spawn and other dangerous creatures that the divine races struggle to comprehend, let alone face. The nations of Gelspad have spent the last century and a half rebuilding, and in some cases, building new societies from scratch. Though a tentative peace among the nations existed for decades following the Titans' war, this armistice eventually eroded. The continent today is largely in turmoil, in recent decades, King Verduk, called the Black Dragon, has sent his armies on a mission of conquest into nearby nations and has amassed a mighty empire known today as the Calastian Hegemony. When the last Titan fell, the gods and their faithful among the divine races were victorious. However, the victory quickly presented a new problem. What should be done regarding the enemy survivors, collectively referred to as Titan Spawn? The victors debated eradicating all the Titans' foul creatures, but the wiser among them knew that this would be a long and costly affair, if not perhaps an act of outright evil. Ultimately, Hedrada and Denev reflected upon this problem and found a solution. After the war, the gods, under the auspices of the Lawgiver, offered asylum to any Titan spawn who sought it, as long as they abandoned their loyalty to the Titans agreed to worship the gods and set, instead and sought peace with the divine races of Skarn. Many titan spawns scoffed, wishing to continue the war rather than defect to the other side. Yet a surprising number sought peace. Those who agreed to these terms were known as the redeemed, and as far as the gods are concerned, they had equal standing with the divine races. This law is recognized in most cities and nations of Gelspad, one notable exception being the Calastian hegemony, where people of nearly any race other than human are considered second class, if they are allowed citizen citizenship at all, or not imprisoned or even slain outright. On Gelspad, there are four races from which most of the redeem hail. Asathi, Ironbred, Orcs, and Slytherin. Out of habit, these races are collectively referred to as the redeemed, though in fact, there are many individuals and groups among them who remain loyal to the Titans. There are still tribes and sects of robed serpent folk, orc and Slytherin, for example, who serve the Titans and oppose the gods and their worshipers. Yet any former Titan spawn who forsakes the Titans and swears Hedrada's vows may claim the title. 
So there may also be former Titan spawn individuals or groups or of other less common races that call themselves redeemed. Now, our adventures, their entire adventure took place within the Calastian hegemony, which you've been hearing a little bit about. Allow me to give you a little bit of their history. King Verduk's empire is the largest to emerge on Gelspad since the Chardunni empire, which crumbled centuries ago with the divine war. The black dragon's rule began with regicide, a bloody coup fomented by the ambitious young Prince Verduk. While Calastia had shown a hawkish temperament prior to the coup, in the 60 years since Verduk rose to power, Calastia has come to control most of the southeastern nations of the continent. The wily old monarch continues to extend his empire with each passing year. However, despite its name, the Calastian hegemony is rife with internal struggle and political maneuvering. Though Verduk rules with an iron hand, the members' nations of the hegemony contain some degree of autonomy, especially those who have proven their worth and service to the empire. Some nations have thrived under this structure. Verduk, a formerly beleaguered nation of halflings, for example, is one, exa one such example. Others, such as the recently annexed Anquila, suffer more deeply from the tension between their position in the empire and the cruel yoke of the black dragon. Even as Verduk lengthens his reach, no one in the Empire is unaware of his advanced age and his lack of an heir. The vicious jockeying for position among his trusted advisors is widely known, having become the subject of countless verses, songs, plays, and jests. Many of the most prominent nobles, including the generals of the Hegemony's armies, have laid plans for ascension to power in the wake of Verduk's passing especially if he were to die without an heir. The maneuvering remains mostly behind closed doors for now, although more than a few assassination attempts have been made in recent months. Some cunning, others very clumsy. The Black Dragon is fully aware of the current political climate. He did not win his throne and maintain it for six decades without being incredibly politically savvy. The king has never spoken publicly about the future of the hegemony after his passing. However, those closest to him know that he has various plans of his own. His most recent wife, Queen Galita, in his is his final hope to conceive a legitimate heir. And failing that, Verduk has other candidates in mind to assume power once he's gone, including the queen. Of course, all of this assumes that the black dragon might pass from this world. Verduk may well have some means of cheating death altogether and achieving the immortality he surely craves. Since Verduk took the throne, his empire has grown to include five nations and one city-state beyond Calastia itself. One of those being New Veneer, the city-state, the, the nation that our players were in. It was once one of the most stalwart and prominent nations during and immediately after the Divine War. But New Veneer has fallen on hard times. When Prince Erlis rose to power following the death of his father, the Calestian hegemony was greedily consuming the nearby nations. In order to spare his people a costly war, the prince offered up his nation to the hegemony. For his oaths of fealty to Verduk, he kept his head although he is now a ruler a little more than name. He still lives a life of luxury in the nation's capital, Femulae. As his nation becomes more entrenched within the Calestian hegemony, Erlis similarly descends further and further into blissful oblivion. He renamed the city of Aridilia after himself, now calling it Erlesian, and established the town as a place of vice and opulence. New Veneer has had a strong tradition of goddess worship, and some say Titanus worship before the Divine War. Belsameth, Idra, Madriel, and Tenille have all been popular goddesses with a female-dominated clergy. Since the convention of Vera Trey, New Veneer has attracted more than one assassin's guild and numerous death cults. Belsameth herself is said to visit the Blood Steps on the nation's northern border occasionally. New Veneer's crime rate has skyrocketed in the years since Erlis' ascension, 
and many citizens have fled its borders as best as they were able to be replaced by grifters, thieves, and thugs who found safe haven in this lawless nation. Our players, our characters, can attest to the lawlessness of Elysian, at least. All right. Now that you have revisited the history of Scarn at large, the dichotomy of the redeemed, the titan spawn, and the divine races, as well as a little bit of the government and political atmosphere of the part of the Gels of the part of Gelspad that you are located in. It's time to remember. Hmm. Let us call back upon what happened all those months ago in real lifetime, but has now been two years in game time at the end of last season. So. Veterans from last season, Gar, Yane, Lamalthun, and Dabuk. Let's piece together, see what you can remember of how last season went from beginning to end. I think I'm going to speak for everyone and go, uh... What do you mean, speak for everyone and go, uh... Who do you think took notes the entire time? You. You did. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's it was obviously a joke, but Perfect. Uh, like I'm not in the first part of this story, so I will leave it up to you guys. I was gonna say you didn't step in until about let's see, let's see. The cave with the demon spawn, episode, Titan spawn. Epi episode five. Session five. <laughs> okay. So we started out with uh, Gar. Uh giving last rites to uh, Salazar Papadopoulos. Salazar. The captain, of the, the captain of the guards, brother's favorite street musician. Uh, <laughs> I'm so I, I proud of you right That's now. That's amazing that you got that. This seems important, yes. so I'm writing it down early. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, uh, in order to gather a large crowd, as is the... Uh, normal method of rights for a follower of Idra. Uh, I gathered a whole group of people from Knob Goblin by offering them my uh, dwarven ale. God damn it. Uh, got, Piet got Pieter awakened and uh, was convinced with the help of uh, Lamalthun. Yes, let's go. He's giving you dwarven ale. Uh, Got the whole entire procession to follow me, which created an even larger procession until finally I had 500 people and started this whole entire thing. Gave Peter all the booze, and then we created our own giant Salazar Day. We did. We created Salazar Day. That they've always had. They have always had it. Which happened? We... Which happened three years ago because they killed the dragon Salazar. Uh, or 10 years ago when something else, I don't remember, but yeah. Something, something people. Salazar. Oh, I could look it up, but I'm it's, I'm going I, I think freehand on that. <clears throat> so uh, uh, we have the giant party. Uh, Yene shows up at the edge of town, uh, meets a nice lady who uh, totally doesn't die. Uh, we all basically see speaker 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 who remembers the speaker's name i'm looking for it come on yeah no i'm looking for it because i'm on pieter and i'm like mr speaker person all right <clears throat> let's just go with this xander speaker xander yes which I might not have actually written that part down. Anyway, uh, Speaker Xander tells an entire fun story about the winds before promptly getting killed and his heart taken out uh, by Salazar Papadopoulos, uh, which begins our whole entire... The dead guy. Um, Didn't they yeah, the take his guy. face? No, it was the Yeah, heart. they took his face. Yeah, they took his heart, but they had his face. Yes, Salazar's face which we checked, it wasn't Salazar himself because I went and looked at the body and the body was still there and the body was still undisturbed. Okay. Which is how we knew that they were face dancers. We just didn't know how. 
Uh, so, Horst basically says, uh, uh, all of you guys, I don't know why uh, you're here, because uh, you're all not humans, except for Gar. Yeah, you can go, Gar. Uh, you guys get thrown in jail overnight. Uh, I talk to Horst and talk him into, uh, well, not talk him into, his higher ups talked him in, or told him he had to look into it. He sent us because it was what we had and gave me in charge. I, th I think there was, like, we could fast forward through a lot of political Yeah, no, I was going to go fighting. and say, we, we found a doll for uh, people. Oh, wait, no, that's after we did other things. Uh, we went to the uh, tents where the uh, speaker was, met with his quadruplet dancers. Uh, oh, that's right. There was a whole troop. Well, there was quadruplet dancers. That's right. Uh, one of which was having an affair with a guard. Yep. Uh, we found a couple of red herrings before Bell Smith told us, you're not doing my thing fast enough. Here you go. Go to the blood steps and uh, kill more mo or find more mo bits for me. And yeah, we found more bits. than more mo bits. We found we found Duvac. We found a Duvac. Oh, we picked up some yes. pets. Oh yes, yes. Uh, no, not we. Oh, yeah. We, Yane and I picked up pets that weren't flesh eaters. Flesh strippers, flesh strippers. But they had a statistical likelihood to be flesh strippers. Yes. Statistically likely that they were flesh strippers, but we didn't care. They didn't uh, care if they were in their backpack and then ate through their, their lower back in the middle of the night. It was fine. It would have been cute. Uh, they looked like BB Rattos. <laughs> I remember, uh, I remember Im that. Imminent we... death is cute. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that once we found Duvac, we continued further on into the caves, at which point. Yes, we found. Oh no, Duvac was the end of the caves. Oh, yeah, Duvac was the, end of the, Duvac caves. With the other was... people that were uh, prisoners to be sacrificed. He was in the cave for eight days, mm -hmm. nine days, mm -hmm. uh, eight days of constant torture, like flesh stripping and yeah. just driving people mad, and then sacrificing them to a titan spawn, mm. and the yeah. titan spawn had gorged upon all of these bodies and become bloated and uh i was next on the chopping block and yeah so i i decided not to be next on the chopping block uh these guys came in here they made it uh, they broke the, they uh came in started assaulting them i uh broke the handcuffs they had and i proceeded to promptly melt four of them with a chaos bolt and then Brillo took out a char fiend. Indeed. What was that? Yeah. What was that attack he used? Brillo. Force empowered force rend. rend. And yeah, force empowered rend. Yes. The most uh, anime of all attacks. It's great. Hey, where else can you get a sheep that will open its mouth and sucker punch you? <laughs> I love that thing. Okay. For anyone who, who doesn't recall confused, or who very... didn't go through, yeah. Brillo uh, was um, an automaton made out of a sheep carcass? I just would call it a cybernetic sheep. Brillo, like a Brillo pad. Yep. Mm -hmm. oh. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, we had it, our, our uh, made of kimchi played an artificer, uh, uh, an Asafi <laughs> artificer. <laughs> that uh made uh they were a um the uh oh, took a battle master dirt. subclass of artificer which allows you to create uh this automaton that fights for you on your side and decided to make it styled after a sheep uh and uh because it was what was on hand yes No, it was not on hand. Like, it's not like we just came across a sheep carcass. <laughs> we came to a farm after crop passing yeah, with many dirt. other options, at which point... But, but the magic dirt was on the farm where there were sheep. 
No bull, just, just sheep. I'm just pointing out that Susa created that carcass. Yes. Mm -hmm. As in, yes. slaughtered the sheep in order to get <laughs> access to it. Oh, jeez. Did it explode at the end? I don't think so. I think oh, it, no, it didn't explode, Brillo, but it did Brillo, die. Honestly, yeah, Brillo yeah. was the Brillo. MVP of our party. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but Brillo think... did die at the end, remember? Oh, it d did it? Yeah, uh, Brillo, well... Brillo, Brillo was knocked out. No, like, yeah, I but he wasn't. He didn't like. Hair. Yeah, he had to be repaired. But I'm gonna go out on a lamb here and say that Brillo really wasn't a bad <sighs> idea. All right, so we're moving on. We all do yep. this. Was never happen. stop. This day would happen. So anyway, never stop. like I said, ma jar of magic dirt. Uh, <laughs> we went back to town. Uh, we gave Bill Smith the bits because we, I did. You a had a vision, remember? Found out that was yeah, vision of nothing but destruction. If I gave it to somebody else, so I totally presumed. Let's see. Uh, we we actually met Malthun all. Malthun met with the scaled and took on a ten thousand gold debt because you know that's what he do. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that was a little pushed on us. Okay, the was whole scale. The scale, right. the scale, you know, the scale you plot totally, line like, was agreed a whole thing. to take totally that agreed. debt. So like, yeah, it's all on you now. So, like, you are totally now liable for, like, all of Salazar, uh, or, sorry, I mean, like, Speaker Xander's debts, man. Yeah. And he was really he funny. He was a very charismatic guy. And then he snapped his fingers, an entire crowd square just stopped and walked away. And then he became very scary. Yeah. Let's see, what else, what else? Just uh, to be clear, was this Salazar Salazar now risen from the dead, or the thing wearing Salazar's no, no, no. face? Th th this was uh, Speaker Xander's uh, debt that we're talking about. Gotcha. Speaker Xander had a debt because he liked to gamble, and he sucked at it, according to the Scaled, who is basically the uh, lovable scamp of the Thieves-type guild. Like, we like to, you know play magical pranks and steal I stuff like not murder you man they're the robin uh, hoods of the thieves guilds yes that's that's what i was thinking of mm. uh we see uh moira getting her face kissed off and then murdered by a face dancer who jumps 50 feet over a wall to evade us find out a whole bunch of stuff about how they're all happening around uh, sewers and how uh, Horst already knew. Uh, we go on a scaled mission because the scaled are actually in league with the guard uh, down under the city. Find our way all the way down with the help of our wonderful guide Ursula and proceed to uh, go all the way through and find the dark womb eventually who had thousands and thousands and thousands of corpses down there for us all to watch and be demoralized and scared and then killed by. But we won. I, th I think Because you've... the light prevailed. And by the light, I mean the roof caving in. Literally light prevailed, yes. Um, I will say we missed an important part. Um, we did meet uh, Mama Mansuela. And uh, that was that was important for Devok and for me spiritually as John. So, uh, yeah, yes. It, yeah, I might have more, but I decided to start <laughs> shorthanding that because I could have summarized for the next two and a half hours. Yeah. I mean, I got time. Streamline the summary. Probably not great for a stream. <laughs> but, Is there any any other points that anybody wanted to touch on that happened? I think uh, we all got. Uh, hallucinogenic drinks at one point. Mm -hmm. There was a dancing beard. I was not kidding. I think outside of the big meta plot, just uh, remembering the individual sort of like character milestones. So for Lamalthun, um, he got into his um, alchemy. Um, one could call it addiction. <laughs> 
I am grateful so, that you didn't let you me see, drink that, by the way. Uh, I don't appreciate that word. Um, <laughs> oh, um, apologies, apologies. Uh, no, so he found, um, no. Belsameth gave him that book on alchemy, uh, if I remember correctly. <clears throat> yes. She did. Uh, after you were viciously attacked in the blood steps. That's right. I almost died and out Yine in the blood steps. A special, yeah. Yine, yeah. Yine had to heal you. Heal me. Uh, and they chose from this magical garden one particular item. And that is what spurred my desire, my highly important Obsession. desire to yeah, I, partake in particular substances okay, from time I to mean, time. I think we can call it safely call it an, an obsession. Um, um, but yes, yeah, so uh, Lamalfoon has uh, gotten into some alchemy in order to boost his own powers, um, and that has gotten to a point where he has to be taking some of his potions in order to operate at full um, effectiveness. So, uh, real quick here, if I can answer a question in chat. Um, yes, I don't currently know what the uh, tracker for the donation is, but we have two days left, and uh, I'd say if we get another hundred bucks, I'll dye, I'll dye my hair green, dark green. Sure, why not? Oh my! Uh oh! Just, just when we thought we were in the clear. <laughs> so thirty-two sixty, and that's just my personal thing. Oh no! Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, I I will accept that recap of last of last season. That was it was a good good job remembering things. You've all made me proud. All right, so let's meet our veteran characters in depth now. As you've heard their tales, let's hear what they oh, were. So I we were doing that. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Uh, so we'll start with uh, with Gar. Tell us about tell us about Gar. All about what 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 is Gar? Where are some of his abilities? Who does he worship? Things like that. Uh, Gar is a paladin of Madriel. Uh, he may or may not have had past life that he doesn't talk about, and you guys don't know much except don't kill around him because he is very very adamant about that one one in particular thing and he's very serious except for when he's not at which point he's probably drunk because he likes to forget things and booze is a very good thing for him uh other than that uh since the end of last session gar spent uh, a bit of time uh Brewing more booze. Uh, we'll, we'll get we'll get to that in a second. Oh, okay. We'll to, okay. We'll okay. Okay. Dipping ahead. Got it. <laughs> uh, Yane, tell us about tell us about yourself. Uh, he is stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess I will go to that one thing that I sent for everybody. Well, I remember the important. Ever. Oh, sorry. You getting elf conscious? <laughs> There's two of them now. What are we gonna do? Fight you. Um, Fight you. I know. <laughs> in a second. I do remember the really big thing about Yane's backstory, though, was that they were raided by a cultist anonymous with a party of ten. That yeah, mm. that tracks. That tracks. Yeah. So thank you very much, Occultus Anonymous. We are just doing our recap of season one before we dive into session zero. For season two, so come meet the characters, meet the world. You're just in time. I found it. You know, he is a Broadreach elf that grew up in the Broadreach forest. Um, and just as an aside, I use the old lore to blend with the new lore as the story progresses, um, which will explain the following: the Broadreach elves are were. A very matriarchal society, with childbearing being the goal, and status was only gained by motherhood. Yine didn't fit into this paradigm and moved from their original Fox clan to Holly clan as they were more accepting. They didn't feel they fit with the opposite binary role, however, so they decided to travel and find themselves outside the forest. Um... Well, what Gar already recapped is they uh, went to the city, where they met their new friends and crew, 
and they had to adapt to a city environment quickly. Uh, Yunei for a while was just trading animal skins instead of paying people in coins because that was all they had. Treated uh, an entire pelt for like a loaf of bread. It was amazing. It was the it was it was a plate of stew. Oh, for one plate of stew. That's right. Yes. Yes. It's okay. I got I got recompensated. She told me to keep it. Uh, along the journey of season one, they discovered more about their gender, despite various people along the way misgendering. For reference, for viewers, um, this was cleared with the storyteller to show which of the NPCs are shitty and which aren't. Um, the bad guys would constantly misgender Yene, so you knew who to avoid, basically. Uh, Yene eventually gained the attention of the goddess Belsameth, who was not necessarily a good goddess, but she is a goddess of transformations and helps Yene feel comfortable in her own body with a bit of magic. Um, Yene comes away from the experience knowing that they eventually want to go back to the Broad Reach to educate the clans how to branch outside of strict gender roles. Perfect. A very succinct and excellent description of Yine's journey and uh, and uh, what kind of character is Yine? Uh, what like uh, what, what's your class and all that jazz? I believe I had multiclassed as a ranger rogue. <laughs> that is correct. Alrighty, Devok, tell us about Devok. Uh, could you give me thirty seconds now? I'm terrified. Okay, moving on. Um, uh, my name's Devok, and uh, he came from a small Orcish village from the plains of Lede. Uh, his his home clan was the Kreku, and uh, he originally. Uh, after losing most of his uh, family, he decided that uh, it was time to uh, branch off and to find his own way in the world. And uh, that is when he uh, went and answered the call to adventure uh, by or by way of his Del Nash, his uh, year abroad, as they would. Or, or, as he would and uh, he has been searching for a place and people he can call his friends and family ever since All right and uh, Devok had made allusions to Chaos Bolt uh, in the last season but we've done a little bit of reworking behind the scenes and Devok is now An Eldritch Knight. Excellent. Still got a lot. Of, still got cantrips, and uh, I, I myself, John wanted to get into melee, so I tried kind of mixing those two together. It sounded like fun. I may or yeah. may not have stolen stolen the idea from La Belle too. <laughs> uh, and. Uh... Anything about uh, Devok's history that you want to share? Or is that kind of, we're going to keep that under wraps for now? I believe there was only a, I think there was only a little bit that Devok has shared with the group. Yeah, I I would actually like that to like come Absolutely. out kind of naturally in the storytelling, if that's all right. Uh, yeah. Uh, excellent. And of our veterans, that just leaves Lamalthoon. Saving the best for last, I see. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. old man. <clears throat> Just one small correction. Um, I believe the child was now referring to the horn saw. Broadreach. <clears throat> Lamalthun, like most Rindali elves, was born in the city of Dire Drindal under the rule of the god king, Nalthalos. A uh, young man at the time of the Bridge of Betrayal, he has seen the constant decline of the former splendor that is Dire Drendel. Disillusioned to constant war, the tyranny of Titans, and, the perce and his perceived apathy of the gods, Lamalthud made his escape from a subterranean city he grew up in and fought for. He decided then that the only answer for the redeemed races was to abandon the gods and accept their own individual inner divinity. 
It was our prayers and rituals and beliefs that give the gods their power. This makes us the true power in the universe. For the Malthoon, no more titans, no more gods, no more rulers. After leaving Dire Drindle, he made a short living as a sellsword using his military skills, eventually meeting up with an old acquaintance, Gar. Uh, we go through the festival, everything that we talked about previously. Um, through this course, he formed a bit of a tenuous relationship with Yane, who he's not quite sure how to react around as another elf from a different culture. It's sort of a constant reminder to him of the elf culture and life he left behind um but uh yeah he um he is seeking any power or options that would give him the chance to overthrow the gods since they are the most direct threat currently the titans are locked away the gods are in control he however will never resort to murdering or killing believers because mortals redeemed the redeemed races and the mortals are who he values. Individual life is most important. So he's not out for blood or killing believers. He just wishes that we could move beyond believing in them and accept that we are the source of the universe's power. Um, so, but uh, but of course, you know, yeah. So uh, yeah, that is Lamalthun. He is arrogant. He um, carries that Drindali arrogance with him. Uh, thinks very highly of himself. Um, but uh. I think he's a good guy at heart. Yeah, he just needs to learn how to say broad reach. Horn saw. Broad reach. Child. Child. The funny bit here is that Lamalthoon's like maybe 15 years older than Yune, <laughs> and as an elf, that's like nothing. Yeah, that so is it's, it's, inconsequential. Yeah, we went and looked at the timelines of like when we were born and what we experienced, and we were like, oh yeah, I'm not that much older than you. <laughs> <laughs> Child. Um, so yeah, um, he started off last season, mechanically speaking, there's a big old fly in my apartment all of a sudden, to figure out where you came from. <laughs> Um, How do you stat that out? I'm sorry. How do you stat How out do you a big old fly? Out? Well, there's it's a lot of feats. It's a lot of feats. Um, so <laughs> you uh, at least six. Mechanically speaking, last season he was a a wizard, fighter wizard, multi-classed out. Um, he was beautifully ineffective in combat for the most <laughs> part. Wizard <laughs> um, out. But um, we did a little bit of reworking, and we have a story element as to why he has been rebuilt into something else. Uh, are we sharing that now, or do we want to talk about that later? Uh, let's go ahead and share it now. So, at this point in time, the Malthoon is no longer a multi-classed fighter wizard. He is now a rogue soul blade. Big shift. <clears throat> But I think it's a fitting one, and uh, I'm sure uh, yeah. when, we get, when we get to it, Lamalthoon will give a uh, bit of an explanation in character as to the yes, shift. It is. Correct. Alrighty. Thank you, my veterans. Uh, it was a lovely description of characters, their personal stories, and uh, who you were. But now, it's time to meet the new blood. Our brand new, wonderful adventurers that are joining our story for this season. So, let's start with Keems. Tell the wonderful audience about your character, their backstory, as much as you want to share. You know, of course, there's going to be some juicy secret bits that you want to keep to yourself. Uh, but, you know, in general, your upbringing and uh, what you've been doing as an adventurer and kind of an in-lore explanation to why, how you got to, you know, level whatever, how you became more powerful. Uh, and, you know, describe your character physically, what they look like, uh, their abilities, and things like that. Sure thing. Um, so my character's name is Sayana. She is a hollow legionnaire, and in, compar in comparison to a lot of the other races of Skarn, um, this race is still fairly new. In fact, um, the oldest hollow legionnaire is probably about 40 years old. 
Um, and what makes the Hollow Legionnaire super cool is that they are actually spirits and souls bound to a suit of armor. Um, these souls are from heroes and warriors who have already fallen and have already lived their life, and they're connected and made into this construct. Um, unfortunately, most Hollow Legionnaires don't really have a good understanding of their past life and their memories. Um, and that is also the same for Sayana, though there are times where she does get a very strong feeling of maybe who she was or some of the things she might have been connected to in her past life. Um, so Sayana, I believe, is about 20 years old, um, but as a Hollow Legionnaire, she was born um, fully grown, if that makes sense. Um, she has always looked the way she has looked now and never younger. Um, she was born atop the, I believe, the Adamantine Tower in the Gleaming Valley, and she has always felt um, very not at place there. Um, they worship a god of light called Korean. Um, and although she was has always been very thankful for, you know, giving us being given a second chance at life um, and being able to continue on, she's never felt quite at home in the Gleaming Valley. And so it was for that reason she left. Um, something within her spirit just said, you know, this isn't the place I belong. And so in her travel, she actually um, came upon a clergy of um, the god, the clergy of the Vangal, one of the gods of Skarn. And he um, might not, his teachings might not sit very well with Gar of all people, um, because Vangal wants to see all the rivers of Skarn run red for no reason, but to see it run red. Um, he's not one who really like values victory. Um, he doesn't want to lose, of course, but you know, he wants to see bloodshed and that's all he cares about. And so although this was very different from everything that uh, Sayana was taught growing up um, in all the or I guess growing up in the sense of her time in the, the Gleaming Valley um, it felt most at home for her and so she has been traveling with them um, spreading blood and killing as many people as she rightfully can um, with those people and so that's how she's kind of been for the past few years. Um, in terms of how she looks, she wears a half plate of armor um, that's laced with gold runes. Um, her skin, her hair, and her eyes all glow a very faint purple. Um, so if you get close, you know, she could probably light a book up for you at night. Um, and that's Diana. Awesome. Fantastic. You're a Vangalite? You worship is. Vangal? Yeah. <laughs> that's, oh, that's gonna be fun. That's gonna be rough. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of natural. dead bodies. So let them hit the floor. Let Fuck the it. bodies hit the floor. Yeah. Mm. Uh, would you like to kind of uh, describe what uh, Sayana looks a little bit like? Yeah, so as a hollow legionnaire, um, she's a construct. So um, although she's not like, although she's a little see through, she's not. Um, you can't like wave her hand, wave your hand through her body, and it'll pass through, and none of that. She's very much solid. She doesn't need to eat or sleep or do any of those things that mortals need to do, unless she wants to. She can, but it would just be for funsies. Um, so she wears, um, like I said, the half plate of armor that's kind of strewn with the gold symbols across it. Um, she wears a red cape and gladiator shoes as well um and her body and her hair and everything else glows a faint translucent purple you can kind of see through her a little bit i love her awesome. i would die for her <laughs> am i sure she's gonna love you too based on our previous conversation that is fantastic uh i am very excited uh to get Sina with the rest of the group um, so, yep, that's a great story of, uh, you know, your origins, what you're doing, where you came from. Uh, maybe talk about what, what is, what has Siam most recently doing? What would they have been doing, uh, while the, our veterans were going on their adventure and becoming heroes of New Veneer? Uh, what was Sayana doing? That is a good question. Um... I think Sayana has probably taken up adventuring as much as she can um, because that gives her a reason um, to go forth and, you know, kill people in honor of Van Gaal. Um, however, I think 
as time goes on, she begins to grow more and more conflicted over her choices. Um, she feels like this is what she needs to do, but she doesn't know if she wants to. So she's probably been doing a lot of searching, maybe learning about different people, religion, races, um, in the in Skarn um, to see what really speaks to her and maybe just creating a new life outside of the one that she previously had or maybe just following in those same footsteps. And by doing that, naturally giving uh, worshippers of Vangel a slightly better name as you're not just wantonly destroying and killing, you're actually, mm -hmm. you know, learning and talking and then deciding whether or not you want to slit their throats in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. Perfect. <clears throat> a very measured response. I like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I appreciate the uh, ask questions first, slip throats later. <clears throat> All right. Uh, well, that was a fantastic introduction. Let's see a birdie follow it up. Please tell us all about your character. I feel like we're going to get along. The Manticora and the Turali were the children of Van Gaal, first created by the god of blood and death. Uh, as his apex hunters. You know, they're the cat folk, they're the lions, and from Termana, the next continent over, the panthers and cheetahs and whatnot. Seeker Pajat is one of those, though you wouldn't know it from looking at them. They are a philosopher and a scholar and an artist, and they've been traveling for a long time in the pursuit of building that knowledge, seeing what they can do to test the boundaries of magic, seeing what they can do to test the boundaries of their own understanding. And they've gone a long way from home for a lot of reasons, not least of which were uh, twofold. They have a theory now that they need to test and they have a curse. Pajat in the process of doing their regular doctoral work of you know taking apart ceremonially cleaning the corpses, acting as a coroner, opened up a lot of different bodies and started to come up with an anatomical model for the things that the gods created and it's raising questions that they're pursuing they're very secretive about that and they're very secretive about their magic and a lot of other things um through that process they managed to attract the attention of something that marked them pretty nastily one of the titans put a brand on the back of their hand that soaked them with blood and then all the hair fell off their body. Um, and so I'm playing a hairless cat. <laughs> I uh, drew something. I don't know if we're able to pull it up, but... I stuck it in Twitch chat. Somewhere. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We need to get Seeker some hand-knitted sweaters. <laughs> Ooh, very naked. A little naked cat. I was really interested in pursuing, you know, the idea of the ancient polymath, the sort of person who, you know, regardless of their approach, had the, the clean white robes and would walk around thinking about stuff, usually before offering any sort of help, if helping at all. Um, through the various trials that they've gone through, through the various cultures that they've lived in, they've become particular friends with the Asathi. They lived uh, overseas a while in an Asathi commune, uh, and in fact learned how to tattoo and to do certain types of surgery from them. Uh, they're more at home tattooing on scales than skin, and they're more at home using a hollowed out fang than they are a needle. But that love uh, has definitely come with them as they've gone. That said, they've grown more cynical. They're they're very strict, very straightforward, kind of utterly humorless. Uh, definitely the kind of person who will just repeat what they say a second time if you disagree with them. And and I'm gonna try and play that up in a charming way as much as I can. Awesome. Fantastic. Uh, so kind of the uh, same question I asked Keems, what, 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 what is it that uh, the Seeker has been doing? Uh, what would they have been doing when uh, the rest, our veterans, were becoming heroes of New Veneer? Over the last three years, they crossed the Blood Sea. 
And that raised even more anatomical questions, you know, learning in depth the sailors' lore and what people have been saying on the coasts about the dead, undead, living titan at the bottom of the sea that's constantly bleeding. Um, that raised a tertiary goal, and they've been carving a slow path across the Gelspod, pursuing information after that, because now they want to dissect the titan, and they want to mm. dissect a god to see what's different. Yes, I imagine for the Seeker, the idea of floating just, you know, however many feet above a dying Titan would be very, very interesting and very much uh, cause lots of ideas to start forming. It's a perfect opportunity. It's just this pesky ocean is in the way. <laughs> exactly. Figure out how to drain millions and millions of gallons of water and then problem solved. Yeah, they've got three or four notebooks on their person. One for theories, one for spells, one for plans and the like. Perfect. All right. I think that is a good meet a meeting of our wonderful new players who will be joining our veterans. So we've learned about the past of our characters, what they were doing last season, but Two years has passed since our finale for last season. So, players, what have your characters been doing for the last two years? You ended Heroes of New Veneer. You even went so far as to meet Prince Erlis. A feast was held in your honor. What have you been doing since then? Did you all stay together the entire time? Did you go off on your own for a little while? Did you have enlightenment? Did you sit around and get drunk the whole time? Hey. Not, aim not aimed at anyone in particular. Um, did anyone stay in the city? I stayed I in the city. Did you? Because that... Like, that's what Devok would have done. Um, he would have stayed in the city, and I think he would have gravitated towards, like, if Gar stayed in the city with him, he would have tried to stay in touch with Gar as a person, as a contact he knew. Um, so when you say stay in the city, do you mean you would have stayed in the capital where you had the, the feast, or you would have gone back to Elysium? Where you back all... to Elysium. Okay. Um, to help rebuild the city. Um after that like he he would he would honestly think that all the frivolity and the you know, all the niceties and all the grandeur like that's that's a great token at token thing and that's awesome but there's work to be done would be his mindset um and he would go back and he would uh, try and help out the city as much as possible and everyone in it and uh if people wanted to go with him that'd be great he would he would hang out there, and uh, most importantly, for my transition, I believe, uh, he would be uh, training with the, the guards there in their in their martial ways, and uh, trying to mix in his own brand of spell casting into that, and uh, that the results will be uh, evident once we go clickety clackety. Time to get attackity. <laughs> Okay. Uh, did Devok make any uh, new, any significant friends or fo or foes? Uh, friends, like he would have tried. He's Devok is is a little bit of a self insert <laughs> in some ways. Um, so he would be very kind of awkward to talk with people face to face. Um, but like he would be the first person to be like, "Hey, you need help? Let's go." Uh, and so he would be very soft spoken, but he would try and let his actions speak for him. And, uh, like he would, I, I, I think that he would try and get to know the new captain of the guard there. Um, he would try and help out with that. And even like he would want to go back and, uh, see Mama Mansuelo because that place was clearly amazing. Uh, he would, uh, I believe it was Ursula who gave us the tour of the mm -hmm. underbelly. She, uh, she was your guide to uh, the, the area where the nursery was. And I uh, 
I, I believe I asked her because I was very uh, interested in the architecture and the history of the city itself. Uh, I asked her if I could come back to, to kind of take a tour when we're not like going somewhere to die. <laughs> <laughs> Under better circumstances, sure. Right. And uh, like I would want to spend some time with Ursula uh, if she's okay with it, just hanging out with and just doing history and nerd stuff. That'd be awesome. Um, okay. Would, then, would, you, would you also want to? I know you said you're, you know, hanging out with the guards and doing all that, but remember the guards and the scaled are, you know, pretty interwoven. Uh, would you have joined either faction? Would you have joined the scaled? Would you have officially joined the guards? Uh, or would you have just kind of remained in the middle somewhere? He would he would have been a freelance because like he would have he would have attachments to both sides of it and like asking him to pick between there between them isn't really his style which like <laughs> as from personal experience that will distance himself from some people who are like oh yeah well you can't decide whatever just go on your way um but yeah like he'll he'll want to kind of foster better relationships between them and specifically like try and curb the bad tendencies of the of the skill they're like no we don't really need to beat up them i'll go take a look i'll get you your money back stuff like that you know like uh yeah so he would he would try and keep the peace as much as possible help people in the city along uh i think he actually would have made he would have made at least one or two enemies among the scale okay um not in any sense of like he directly interfered with them or anything like that or well not in any sense that he was outright challenging with them but he would have been like no you can't do that on a certain you know on a certain wavelength and pushed his clout a little bit to make it happen it's like uh you really can't like shake down a person's husband he's a single father you know like i'll get you the money don't worry about it but you really can't do that and if you do that you're gonna have a problem and that problem's gonna be me um and so like he he probably stepped on one or two people's toes but never like crossed the line into becoming an outright enemy i think okay do you um, use the most harsh of insults against someone from the scaled you sir have pressed your thumb <laughs> sir have pressed your thumb um and I think, respectively, like he would he would have been challenging to the guards as well. But I think that's much less of a conflict point because I think like the guards I think more aligned to what he's trying to do. So he'd be like, "Hey, like the taxes on this place, I'll pay for them. Don't worry about it. Can we just look the other way?" And they'd just be like, "Okay, yeah, sure, whatever." But I think like some of the people in the scale might have taken that a little bit more personally. Um. Okay, I like it. That would definitely keep Devok busy for the next two years. Uh, okay. Uh, just one last question for Devok. Uh, you so you said you spent the entire time in Elysian. So did you ever check in on your family or go take a visit or anything like that? Um, I think he would have actually been. He would have tried seeing if he could get wind of them as they were crossing the plains and see if like he could if they were going to meet up in a place that wasn't completely you know taking weeks and weeks to get back sure um, he would have if it was convenient he would have done so but i don't think he's ready to go back just yet um but okay i'm hoping i'm hoping my path takes me there someday all right all right Thank you, Devok. Who who else? Who else like to talk about their last two years? Well, uh, Gar would have spent most of the time uh, still in Erlysian. Uh He uh, would have tried gathering all of the guards that had been left, gathering all the materials that were obviously left free from the prodigious lack of owners now. Uh, made a memorial for everyone uh, so that 
it was never going to be a thing that was forgotten. The, the Titans once again caused such ca harm and destruction. Life is sacred, and uh, Gar would just have this giant rant at the uh, uh, unveiling of this giant memorial, and he'd try and get the guards to be a little bit better at being guards and doing their actual job, make the city a little bit safer, but knowing full well who he's working with, kind of just bare bones in it. Okay, guys, just remember, killing is bad. Try to stop doing that. Make sure that if people are getting robbed, they're, you know, not bad people getting robbed. They get their money back as much as you can. So just making them normal you know, cops. Yeah, trying to make them actually effective cops that can, you know, deal with things instead of the bribery and whatnot that they already have going on. Gar sounds like a dad, for sure. For some strange <laughs> yeah, reason. Yeah, but, but Gar okay. has this one thing that... Gar's got one thing that he wants to instill in all of them. Your guards, which means when you're on the clock, you're on the clock. Everything should be serious. When you're off the clock, just make sure you're not wearing your uniform. If you do things like go drink, try and still uphold yourself. But, you know, it's okay to drink. As I'm sitting there with the dwarven <laughs> ale in hand telling them this. Devok I'm not on the clock right now, guys. Devok would have definitely been there. One or two of the, like, he was dressing down. The, the, the you know, the new soldiers to come in and be like, Oh, yeah, don't do that. And... Don't don't fucking drink it, <laughs> and he'd be like, "Yeah, because you because you were fucking sober the entire time." Yeah, yeah. Hey, that's I was sober fun. through every fight. Every, I don't remember that. Plus, don't you remember the dancing beard, right? Okay, I didn't actually drink so much of that that I went insane. I mean, I didn't go insane. I went outside for a couple hours. What are you trying now to here, do? Here, have a drink. And I give him a thing of my green dryad drink. Oh, so, hell yeah. This would lead to a night on the town. Hell yeah. Oh, yeah. And I brewed quite a bit of my uh, dwarven ale while, uh, over this time. Okay. Because uh, it's everyone's favorite. Did you try to check in with any old contacts or family or anything like that? Does Gar have any sent letters? And, uh, I would not be contacting any of the family that uh, I would know is still alive. Uh, as they are all related to my past life, which I don't want to deal with anymore. Uh, however, I would be sending letters down to uh, the people in Duro for that I used to know, uh, trying to get more uh, non-human population accepted in early soon. Okay. Because if you guys can like the dwarf and ale, why can't you like the dwarf that made it? <laughs> Okay, and uh, any uh, would Gar have made any particular friends or foes, or attempted to uh, you know settle down maybe with somebody or anything like that? Uh, settle down? No, there's way too many worshippers of Idra that I need to uh, work so hard to uh, help. Uh, ah. But enemies. Enemies, I'm certain some people at least uh, were unhappy with Gar's uh, vehement uh, no murder thing because I'm sure somebody probably had a good job that they lost in that city as the uh, hired murderer. Sure. Okay. Okay. Who, who else wants to talk about their gap years? Uh, you know, you would have, I think, tried to improve their hunting skills on different terrain uh, instead of just the broad reach. Obviously, um, broad reach is always going to be the best because they were born there. But also, I think they might be following around the Malathun just to drive him crazy. Okay, so we can bring the Malathun here. Uh, it, 
would you willingly allow Yune to accompany you, or is this kind of Yune is uh, following? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um. He he would obviously try to press Yune's buttons to get them to leave him alone, but hoping they do stick around because he does he likes Yune. Like you know, they are a young naive elf growing better and more comfortable every day, so it's good to have them around in general. So it's that very okay. it's that very tenuous um, frenemy. What are some shenanigans the two of you got into? <laughs> I might have dragged Lamalthoon into the Broadreach to show him what it was like. A joint trip into the Broadreach? Okay. Uh, would you have brought Lamalthoon uh, to any of your clans? Uh, yes. I probably would have first dragged him to Holly because they're more uh, open to gender variation. And then I probably would have been like, you. Could you accompany me to Fox Clan so I can confront these bad memories? Mm, okay, so we've opened up a little bit about your past to Lamalthoon. All right. When, as as would have been the case with anything last season, once something serious gets brought up from Yune, like he would very much be like, absolutely, let's go tell this tribe they're a bunch of assholes. <laughs> <laughs> All the joking and prodding would stop once an actual real conversation starts. Yes. Uh, so what was what was that like? Did you were you successful? Were you not successful in altering some people's views? Hmm. I will leave that entirely up to you. As together, the two of you would be able to present a formidable charismatic force. Um, but it's up to you whether or not people would be willing to listen to what you had to say. I think that, as is the nature of people, when presented with a new idea, a lot would balk. Um, but some would be like, hey, this this makes sense. Or, hey, I identify with that and I never knew because I didn't have terms for it or whatnot. So I'm sure it would cause some tension in the clan, but I don't know. They, I, I could think that they would come to a compromise considering this is a fantasy world and it doesn't of have course. to be full of a bunch of bigots. Absolutely. Like I said, it's it could have been as or not as successful as you like. As Scar I, I, yes. So Yane was raised there. Did you have yes. like a best friend? Did you have somebody in particular back home that was really important to you? Because I want to know how it went with them in particular. Uh Yane did not actually have very many friends. They kept to themselves because they struggled with who they were. Um there was and, a mother-like figure you had at the Holly clan. Yes. I forget what name you gave her, because you ended up naming her, but I don't remember what it was. I'd have to go back and... and uh, I don't know if I... I don't even know if it'd be my notes. I'd have to watch the session, probably. Well, I think... So Holly, Holly definitely was more accepting. Um, even in the old lore, which was super matriarchal. Halen. Hmm? Oh, okay. That cool. was the person's name. Thank you. Um, even even in the old lore where they're super matriarchal before Onyx Path picked up the um, the world, the Holly Clan would make um, men in the position of mothers if that is what they felt drawn to, whereas the other clans were not so open. Because um, Mother was was not just a um, 
process, it was also a, a title. Um, and, and so a lot of the other clans would also be like, oh, you haven't had a child, well, you don't earn the title. But Holly would even take uh, women who could not, for whatever reason, have children and be like, okay, you're a mother now. Um, so that's where Yune went, thinking that maybe they would try a masculine role, but they really just didn't fit in with that either. So that led to their branching off. Okay. Uh, so that was kind of Yune's long-term goal was to go back and talk to their clan. Uh, did Yune have a new goal? Have the, I mean, like, you might not have one yet, but, you know, do, do they? I think that they definitely would. Um, however, I, I need to think about that one because I don't okay. want it to just be like, and, and this is a totally valid uh reason but blah, 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 blah. I don't want it to just be adventuring um, even though that is an entirely valid reason for your character or entirely valid goal for your character my mouth just anyway. English hard English is hard of course <laughs> um, so I don't know I want to come up with something Okay. With a hook in it, like uh, that that previous story, because that previous story was super deep, and um, I want to come we up with something that quality again. We can absolutely come up with something. I'm sure uh, Bellsmith might also have some ideas for you, as uh, you are one of their favorite uh, mortals <laughs> to to. Uh, <laughs> Elzameth seems like a kind goddess. She's she's a barrel laughs. Hi, I will. I will say we made a lot of assumptions about her before oh, we, before we actually got to before we got to know her. Like we were, I think we we're all a little complicit, just a, just a little bit. Um, Gar Gar refuses to believe that. And like, she turned everything on her head. Like she she is now one of my favorite deities in this pantheon. <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right, well, so Lamal, oh, go ahead. Oh, oh I was just going to say, uh, Yene had grown up with the worship of Denev, who was a titan, however, a good titan. Um, so I probably want to involve my my goal with Denev, but also Belsameth somehow. Not a problem. All right, so Lamal Thun, besides a trip into Broadree Tornsaw, uh, with Yune. What else is it that Lamothin was doing over the past two years? I'm going to say that after the journey into um, the Hornsaw, uh, Lamothin would look to Yune and be like, I'm glad that I was able to share that with you. I'm glad I was able to be there for you. And we've spent the better part of a year traveling together, but where I go next, I have to go by myself. I will see you again. Um, so after that particular thing, he would break off by himself, and he's looking for um, certain societies. And I was trying to skim through his book to remember some things. Um... But he's looking for <clears throat> groups, I'm imagining some sort of monastic society uh, that focuses on the development of the mind and the expansion of consciousness. Um, having now gotten into the type of alchemy that he has, he has experienced some transcendent... Uh, mm -hmm. ex he has, he has had some transcendent experiences. Um, so he is looking to refocus his martial and arcane studies into within. And the best people who do that are monks and people who spend all day meditating and harnessing the power of the self, which is his whole idea. Uh, so over the next several months, um, he would be spending time with people with that knowledge um however 
in representation of both the way that Lamalthoon is and with the limited amount of time that we have. Um, he is obviously not a master of this by any means. He has some basic rudimentary ideas of how these things work and he's kind of just mixing these entry level ideas together to form this hodgepodge of techniques that he's trying to use. Um, so by combining Arcane, Marshall, and now the this mental focus, he has come out of um, these um, these temples with a better idea of um, psychic and uh, psionic uh, powers. Um, I was looking to see what might be someone who could get involved with there. We could come up with a group or use one of the new uh, societies in the Gelspad book. Uh, <clears throat> we'll we'll uh, we'll, fig we'll we'll figure out which because I want I definitely want you to be able to research it and mm -hmm. pick one that you would most align with. Right. Um. um so again, he's the, what he does with his time is he does these exercises, both the meditation and, and the martial and things like that. But then at night he goes to his room and he takes out his alchemy set and he is just mixing together these things randomly and seeing what happens. So he will <laughs> mix together and distill down some potion that he has no clue what it does, drink it, um, <laughs> and then go into a meditative state and just see what happens. And that's how he has spent probably the, the, the next six months after leaving the Broad Reach, um, coming away with uh, his soul... Um, soul blade capabilities. Okay. That feels uh, slightly chaotic. The mouth is chaotic? No. <laughs> just, a, just a wee bit. Chaotic? No. The, the He's man, only doing trial by consumption. The on man every screaming potion he that makes. there should be no gods and no rulers and no kings <laughs> and no emperors. <laughs> that. If Seeker ever has a chance to dissect Malthoon, we need to look at his kidneys and livers first. You are all going to have to stand very far back. <laughs> Did um, Malthoon ever make a trip back to Deer Drendel? Uh, no, he is avoiding that place okay. until he knows that he can walk in with all the swagger. Um, <laughs> and, okay. and level six is not <laughs> all the swagger. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, no, he does not want to go back there until he can cause mass hysteria. Um, however, what has uh, made his ears perk up a little bit is in his travels, now having... Again, impatient, he wants things now. He is never going to devote a ton of time to mastering any of these things. So after about six months or so, he leaves the order behind and he's trying to move on to the next thing. Um, and he's probably making his way back to where he thinks his friends would be. Because um, he misses them and you get into adventures and they have different things that they can offer. So, you know, he's kind of making his way around. Uh, but he hears about... Something off in the east. He hears specifically about Blood Sea Alchemy. And that has interest him. And his number one goal now is to see, one, if there's any last things that he can do in this area to help his goals, and then start seeing if we can move east. Because okay. Blood Sea Alchemy is a thing, and it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Awesome. Uh, all right. And then our uh, new characters. Which one of you wants to go next on what you've been doing the last two years? May I? You may. Okay, here's what I think. I run into the mouth on, and then while he's passed out, I stole one of his kidneys, so we're friends now. <laughs> <laughs> this is how friendship works. It was right there, you know, he wasn't using it or was overusing it. <laughs> I need that. <laughs> I did just cross the Blood Sea though. It seems like a great opportunity to have uh great minds run into one another. I know for a fact a lot of 
what I was doing was, you know, sparsely tending to the wounded enough to earn uh, Pajat's keep in a given town. You know, check out the people that are there that can be checked out. They don't do healing magic. They're just a doctor. And so... Yeah, which your services would be very much useful uh, in any of the towns that would be harbor towns on the Blood Sea mm -hmm. as just being close, not even being on the water, just being close to the water makes you perpetually sick. <laughs> you think people would move. Well, the thing is, is all that, co all that you know, commerce of being a port town, is, mm -hmm. you know, it's the, you know, a lot of people go work at a coal mine, you know. Ouch. Um, I think following that coast in any given direction would probably prove for a pretty uh, profitable path to drop a couple peas in there. I think... Pajat doesn't hold court for any particular deity, nor do they have a, a particular faith in them, but they go through the motions very rigorously as they do all things. You know, they consider uh, the exchange of, of faith into boons to be commercial in a way, to be something that, while there's no direct measure for it, obviously there are rules and they've been given ahead of time through ritual and through religion access to a lot of these rules it's not a system that they try to game but it's a system that they maintain a great awareness of and so you know stop in a temple when you're in town if you're going to be dealing with parts of the body pray to Vangel or to Mormo uh, if you're going to be making a deal pray to Belsameth I'm, I'm unclear if they've run afoul of Belsameth yet, or if they've been uh, swooped up into that whole nonsense, I feel like they're still <laughs> probably doing their own thing or under the illusion of doing their own thing for the time being. Probably. We're probably we'll, we might get into a little bit when we uh, create your guys' bonds together you know, in All a right. little bit. Okay. Uh, well, it's on my mind, if you don't mind. I think if you're moving west from the Blood Sea, and from what I see from our tokens, we're kind of going to all meet back up together in New Veneer. Um, maybe some of my time could have been spent in the mountains that separate the Blood Sea and New Veneer, and we could have met up in, like, Baroctorn, maybe? I'm Which for is, that. And then traveled back so together. So that would, that, that would be close to... Uh to your uh, dear Drendel friends. I think that would be perfect. As Brock Torn is, is the uh, dwarven city that mm. is constantly at war. Oh, and then you probably, you probably wouldn't even be welcome. Would not, there. would not be able to go there. You're right. You're right. That is the dwarven city. Then just some village somewhere yeah. in probably the iron tooth pass, maybe possibly. But what if uh, chasing a lead, I went down to your city and as you were going down, you saw, you know, this strange, bloody doctor coming out and it gave you enough heebie-jeebies that you changed your mind like no i'm level six i do not have all the shit that i need <laughs> especially if there's weirdos like this running around down there i'm good with that like just it. kind of floating around that area maybe trying to build up the strength to go back and then just meeting up and kind of you know traveling back east not quite ready to go all right i'm for it yeah so somewhere in those mountains in the tear is it, or Audrin's Tear area, just that that whole mountain pass somewhere in there. Cool. Yeah. All right. So we traveled back from there to New Veneer. Sick. Alrighty. And uh, uh, Sienna, what have you been doing for the last two years? So I definitely think that she would still have been maybe adventuring, um, but I think she'd probably be a little bit more per purposeful these past couple of years. Um, or at least recently, and she might be trying to get more of a worldly sense of how things work in the world, why people worship who they worship um, as she goes along her adventures, maybe stopping by libraries, towns, anywhere where she can gather that type of inter information um, as she tries to kind of ease some of that internal conflict she's been experiencing. Okay. As for the where, I don't know. Wherever she really feels drawn to. Um, so, yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, two years is a long time, so that would give you enough time to kind of, uh, you know, go, go further north uh, or even east off to uh, like the Serpentine Pass and things like mm-hmm. that, or go out and see the orc tribes or uh, it gives you a lot of time to kind of make your way around the continent. Right. Um, so we can kind of maybe pick some places in specific offline where you went to. Um, but I imagine they would be, you know, uh, uh, cities and areas of, you know, probably great religious importance to other deities that you could yes. uh, get some, maybe go visit libraries and uh, temples and things like that that would have uh, important scriptures. Absolutely. Yeah, that sounds great, actually. Okay. Well, now that we've been filled in on the activities of our characters, We're going to take a quick break as it is halfway through our session uh, and we'll come back and we're going to form the bonds that make our adventuring group and strengthen the ties that bring them together. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. We're going to get a little bit of food, a little bit of drink, and we'll see you in about 10 minutes. So 1047 Eastern Standard Time.
And welcome back to our session zero of season two of Fighter Whimsy. Congratulations, players. You've entered the lightning round. I'm going to ask you a set of questions, and you're just going to answer real quick as your, as your character would. So, if there was a cat stuck in a tree, how would your character get it down? Cut the branch. Climb the tree. Climb the tree. Get it. Climb the tree. How, Anything how else would be inefficient. Is, how tall is the tree? Middle tree height. Not I like a. It's not like more... a. Sequo- it's not like a redwood or sequoia, but it's also not like an orange tree. I'd get somebody a lot more capable than me to climb the stupid thing. I'm old. I would do what I would think would be obvious and go grab a ladder. Okay. Uh, what would you consider your character's signature weapon to be? Back full um, of teeth. Teeth? Interesting. It's high yield. It's efficient. You get about 32 per person. That's mm-hmm. more ammo than you get for an equivalent, what, quiver full of arrows. Just got to know how to use them. Straight facts. Um, Cyana would use weapons. the signature weapon of... Oh, Jinx, you owe me a soda? Okay. Signature Ooh. weapon of their patron god. Which is... Vangal. No, the signature weapon. Battle axe. Ooh, battle axe. Now, are you a two-hand battle axe person or one-hand battle axe and the other is... One-hand battle axe, other other hand shield. Okay, I like it. Uh, My signature weapon is a shield. Totally counts. I can can hit people with shield. Shield bash. Shield Um, the correct answer is dueling rapier. Ranged stabby. And I believe that leaves me, so, um... Trying to be original here, failing miserably. Uh, so I'm just going to go with what I have equipped, which is my hand axes. Um, if I have my way soon to become dueling battle axes. Okay. Uh, what is the thing your character left behind in the previous life before they came to an adventure that you missed the most? And that thing can be a person, a experience, or just an actual object. His best friend. His culture. There's a view, if you catch the right angle, off the southern point of Termana, where they used to go with their spouse and children uh, once a year when the stars set just right, that you can't see this far west. Very nice. The forest. I don't know, but I hope to find out. Uh, it's for Devok, it's going to be someone he, uh, left behind. Uh, her name is Groma, and, uh, she has helped him through his years with his adopted clan before he set out on his own. Okay. And uh, what is your character's biggest fear? Mormo. <laughs> it's a big one. Becoming who he once was. Ouch. 
not uh, being happy with who she used to be or who she was. Senescence. Growing too old too fast. Loss. Ow. Leaving behind everything for nothing. Congratulations, player. You just made it through the lightning round with flying colors, might I add. All right. Let's get to those bonds I talked about. I would like each of you, uh, and Lamalthoon and uh, uh, Seeker have kind of got a little bit of a head start on this, but each of you to pick two other characters and come up with a, an event of some sort that caused you to become closer. Um, then you're also going to pick two characters, name an event that caused tensions to rise or maybe to uh, strain the friendship. And you can, there can be crossover between the two characters you pick. So you can have both a strengthening and weakening event with someone if you'd like. Um, but kind of think about it a little bit and maybe uh, try to work together here and figure out some, re some figure out some things that you guys did together that caused you to want to stay for some reason. I'll go first, um, just because I think it's a pretty easy one, like, because this, this is a layup. Uh, I think me and Gar just got shit-faced and went out drinking one night. It was oh. like, hey, you want to go catch up, everyone? You know, and be like, all right, yeah. Well, also then, uh, I figured we made use of the fact that we have that gem, and we didn't really get to use it for anything before, so you kind of taught me some basic primordials so that I can actually send you a couple simple lines from that. Yes, I... Understandable, I, comprehensible lines. <laughs> I, I taught you the basics of primordial. Unfortunately, uh, Devok was also drunk, so in so he might have intentionally or unintentionally mixed in um, a lot of curse words um, that he just rebranded as other words like hey fuck <laughs> hello <laughs> you know fuck you uh, for those Is of you who were not there yeah for those of you who were not there last season uh, our players went to a useless item shop. And hey, it was ye old magic shop. And uh, Gar was able to find a gem of primordial, meaning while he held the gem, he could speak primordial, but he cannot understand it or write it. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and Devok, um coming from where he came from, um, actually knew primordial because he was a sorcerer of the earth um, so he he spoke the earthen primordial dialect and uh he taught he taught some of it and i think like maybe like a week later when gar tries sending him a message he'll he'll like come up to gar confused be like what why did you tell me that you're going to fucking go over that wall <laughs> And then, and then be like, "Oh no, that was that was," uh, and then be like, "Oh no, 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 this is it was have like that was have a nice day," um, and this is how you really say it. I don't know what the fuck I taught you when I was drunk, but all right. So we had a bonding experience of getting drunk and learning primordial together. I like it. Um. I originally was going to say Sayana and Gar should have like a negative experience, um, okay. but I feel like that's very like you know, Death Dominion probably like Dominion of Light or something Paladin. Maybe go with something more of a good experience where Sayana asked Gar why he worshipped the goddess that he does, um, and then maybe them having maybe a really in depth conversation about his goddess and you know his purpose behind that. 
And at the end, I imagine Sayana would be like, you know, although we dis- we worship different gods, I really respect where you're coming from, and I respect your dedication to to your goddess because Sayana doesn't really follow Vangal for any other reason than her something in her telling her to. She doesn't have really any strong ties to him. So maybe seeing something that was a little bit more concrete would really fill her with joy. Okay, so a positive and learning argument about the uh, the gods both of you worship. I like it. We got a more serious spin on my earlier pitch, and that's what if Lamalthon in one of those uh, exploratory meditations ended up in trouble and I uh, gave him Seeker's old morning after cure. Okay. Uh, probably less of a morning after cure and uh, or that's that's how Seeker would play it off, but it'd probably be more of a, uh, no, I legitimately saved your life. You were going to die. What you ingested was toxic. Mm-hmm. I'm yeah. I'm like I'm absolutely good with playing that up. Yeah, like took something and was on the verge of death. Um, and I took something in return. Do you want it to be uh, one teeth, three teeth, kidney, or blood? They're not joking. I'm not joking. Uh, <clears throat> if your medical services require me to give up a physical part of myself, just let me die. Let it be blood, then. You are losing it anyway. It will curdle if you have too much in you, and it will make it easier to cast upon you later. If I could move, I would stab you right now. Well, <laughs> let's get you back to moving, and then you can rethink that. And I have a file of your blood on my person. Yay. I like it. <laughs> I, like it. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> This is awesome. (laughs) I've got other ideas, but I have to write this down first. (laughs) This is amazing. (laughs) Oh. Hmm. Um, Yeah, I think for Lamalfi, like, obviously the thing with, um, with Seeker is perfect. Um, the positive experience with the Ine from earlier, also, um, that yeah. was a really growing bonding moment. Um, oh man. Uh, so we're we're all back together though, right? At this point, so it can be anybody. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We'll say uh, you know uh, uh, over the two years, all of you have crossed paths with each other at some point. Are, are you open about worshiping Van Gogh? Sayana. Yes. Negative experience with Sayana. <laughs> <laughs> and where normally Lamalthoon is um, pretty accepting despite his um... Abrasive- abrasiveness? Yeah, despite his um was sort of extremist <laughs> views, we'll say. Um, uh, hearing that someone not only is like hearing that someone is like actively like, yeah, Vangel, that's my god. Like <laughs> it would be like like I'm imagining this devolved into a screaming match very quickly. Um, blood for the blood gods. <laughs> 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 Heretics. Blood yak for Heretics. the blood gods? Blood yak. Uh, just like, you know, again, um, the idea being just like, Vangel only is, uh, Vangel only is powerful because of the worship that is given to him. And every time you worship, you are powering an evil god, someone who only wishes to kill and spill blood. How can you do such a thing? You know... In thinking about it, I definitely feel like Sayana would have some like problems with Malthoon's overall take, hot take on the gods. <laughs> uh, um, because being that they were the ones that defeated the Titans, um, 
the people or the creatures that drew their very strength from the world, how could we as mortals begin to ha- even harness the power that we give them in any way to, you know, to keep the Titans at bay if Malthun believes that the god should be no more, they should be overthrown. Um, I think she would probably take a negative experience as well. I, I feel like that's a dynamic we can work with. Oh yeah, and uh, just to be clear for everyone, uh, mm-hmm. I know the Malthun is a very loud voice about, you know, no gods, no kings, everything. Uh, that. We're back. Howdy, peoples. Ow. Sorry. Uh, internet gremlins, as uh, Ever likes to say, have taken their toll for a second there. But we have stopped giving them food and water. Uh, so, yes, uh, I, to, I'm not sure we got disconnected, but uh, Akima and Steve were talking about their characters having a uh, close to violent disagreement about not just the worships of God in general. Uh, but worship to the blood god uh, Vandal. And uh, I was clarifying that uh, Lamalthun is very loud in the party and uh, it loves to give his opinion, but that is a super hot take in the world of Skarn uh, for, uh, like uh, Akima said, most people are very thankful that the gods you know, took care of the Titans and because the Titans, we didn't get into the full history. They were just like, willy-nilly creating races and then murdering them and then creating them and then murdering them just just for fun uh so the gods kind of put a kibosh to that whole thing uh so most people are like uh yeah we 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 worship the gods and very willingly because we knew it's not that long ago some some of the races have remembrance and memories of what it was like before that mm, uh, actually i was born during the during the war so. yeah you were born during the you were born during the war but you know you saw some atrocities mm-hmm. but yeah most people are like yeah no i i worship gods and i'm gonna keep doing that i don't care what you say crazy person mm-hmm. i i am willing to also put out that i have not been super successful in any conversion at this point like <laughs> Like, yes, like, and all, anytime like, he has tried, honestly, most people are just like, mm, yeah. okay, respect you as a person, but like, no, nah. th- this, <laughs> like, this character has a goal, but by no means am I like, everywhere I go, I completely change everyone's mind. Like, no, <laughs> like, my message falls on deaf ears for the most part, and that's gonna be I, the way it is for a long time. Quick lore check. Um, did humans and dwarves and elves, they all came before the gods, right? Or did they come uh, after? No, so they came after. The, so like it was like okay. Titans created the gods, and then then all all of them together started making races, mm-hmm. um, mortals. And, except that the mortals could, you know, gods directly benefited from mortals worshiping them, whereas the Titans were just all powerful already. So that mm-hmm. that's why they're just willy nilly killing people because just like ah, eh, you know, they were like it, it was like you know. A, uh, all the mortals were essentially like ants to them. They're just like, eh, you know, whatever. I'll fire. I'll, I'll fry a couple underneath the magnifying glass. Doesn't matter to me. Um, Lamathu's point is though, just because, um, gotta get it out one more time. Just because the gods stop some spooky woo from happening does not mean that they deserve all of our love and affection forever. Perfect. Well done. Thank you. Perfect use. Per- perfect for, use of the redemption. For, for those that are, are new to Warple Tales, uh, there is a, a thing you can redeem with channel points called Spooky Woo, and that was created way back in our first session of They Came From Beyond the Grave? Was it They Came From Beneath the Sea? They came from Beneath the Sea. And so Spooky Woo was coined, and now you can buy a spooky woo where one of the cast members selected by the purchaser has to say somehow in character fit spooky woo into their sentence or whatnot it's it's an old channel reward but it checks out <laughs> <laughs> and it's very entertaining at that 
Hey. Um, I'm also... Uh, sorry, I figured I'll just finish up my last one really sure. quick. Sure. Uh, Duvok. I'm going, yes. to, I'm going to say that I had another negative experience with you, that at some point before we all split up for the two years, um, if you remember, Lamalthoon very specifically stepped in on your, unlike how he treated Yane, stepped in on your heartfelt moment. Um, and um, I'm going to say there was probably another situation where Lamalthoon tried to get you angry or enraged in order to use you as like a tool. Um, and that you, and you picked up on a little bit more that time. Oh yeah, well... Okay, my character hits things with a stick. He hits it very hard. Correct. So this you... does not mean that his intelligence score isn't 16. Yes. But you're <laughs> most beneficial to us when you're hitting things with said stick. Well, I can hit you with a stick if you like. <laughs> I doubt there's much you can do about it. Many have tried. I succeeded, if you remember correctly. Perhaps when we are adventuring, or in dangerous scenarios, less philosophy, more hitty. Less philosophy, more hitty. Coming from the guy who can't shut up about his gods, and how no one cares what he has to say on the, on the matter. And it shows their own short-sightedness to their capabilities. People will learn one day. Whatever it is that is happening, unless it is incredibly useful to Devok at this moment in time, he walks away. That's fine. <laughs> then we'll say that's like the last time we talked before we all met back up <laughs> years <laughs> later. Ooh, <laughs> hard breaker. Ooh. Nice. But, yeah, he's not a big fan of being used. <laughs> uh, a short callback to last season, John Duvac had this really incredible roleplay moment where he was remembering a lot of his trauma and things that had happened to him and was really doing this, this amazing job. However, we were in the middle of a very dangerous dungeon, <laughs> and so the Malthoon legitimately, like, kind of shit on that moment for Duvok in order to, a, to piss a him off, bit. and, like, yeah. A little bit. Like, that pissed him off, but, like, he had a, he had a triggering moment there. Mm -hmm. That pissed him off, but what kept him going, what kept his anger going is, like, He's, he's smart enough to understand is like, yes, he needs to pick his shit up and move on. But what kept him going was Gar was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And it's like, man, I don't got time for this incompetence bullshit right now. <laughs> like he was he was almost more pissed off at Gar that he's always trying to make things OK. And Devok was saying, yes, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> It was a really good moment. It was it was amazing, and like, I actually apologized afterwards because I actually did yell at both of them. So it was so much fun. It was so great. Um, I have a. Oh, go please, ahead, please, go, go ahead, ahead, Seeker. You sure? I already did two things. Do it. You should. Okay, okay, I'll go. Um, this is going to be a positive experience with Yane. Um, and I think this mainly, st that's for you ever. Um, this mainly stems from uh, Sayana's uh, lack of experience with the world as a whole. Um, since she was in the gleaming, uh, in the her, her spire rather, um, for the first maybe 10 years of her life. So she's only been, um, I guess, adventuring or at least outside of her original home for the past maybe five or ten years so i think it would be great if they had like a really awesome conversation about gender roles and what that kind of meant to yane um, and explaining that to sayana too 
I am all about that. Just like possibly a, a happenstance running into each other. And at, how would that go about for your character being that they are typically in their spire? Or she's in her spire. Right. So she would be adventuring by the time she would have met any of you guys. Okay. It's possible that the two of you could have met maybe when the Malthoon left uh, to go out towards the Blood Sea. And uh, after the trip into the Broad Reach, that would be a time when the two of you could have crossed paths. Okay. Yeah, and, and it's probably just a happenstance. Oh, excuse me, ma'am. You know, um, but only because of Yane's appearance. Mm -hmm. And Yune would go, oh, no, you don't have to call me that. I am not a female or a male. And I think Sayana would be very interested in that because I don't, I mean, I wouldn't say that it's not something that would exist um, in the Gleaming Valley. I wouldn't say that at all, but I definitely think it would be something she's just not familiar with or had at least experienced herself. So Yine naturally, would... she'd be curious. <clears throat> Yeah, probably not, because most Hall Legionnaires are very, like, purpose-driven. There's mm -hmm. not a lot of, like, you know, there's not, most of them just don't, you know, take the time to think deep thoughts or, you know, uh, have a, a discussion about that. They're just, they're like, I, you know, I got bigger fish to fry. Like, I, I don't, I don't, I don't have an opinion on it because I'm doing, I'm, I'm focused on this one thing I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. So you, you are, Valley and the Hornsaw Forest, or Broadreach Forest, are right next to each other, aren't they? Mm, they are. So do you think uh, Sienna would have a conception of how the elves, you know, the, the monoculture there typically is? Uh, probably not, just because uh, the clans of the Broadreach are very uh, kind of to themselves. Mm -hmm. And it is like kind of this just well-known thing you don't go into the broad reach unless you absolutely have to, or you live hmm. there, because it's one of those. It's it's you know one of those places you walk in, you don't ever come back out. Cool. Okay, good to know. Broad reach peeps are badasses. <laughs> yeah, Can there's uh, there, help me. There, there's some spooky shit in there. Where is the broad reach area? Uh, it's la it's map? labeled it's labeled Hornsaw on the map. So right next to where your tokens are, it says Hornsaw Forest. Got uh, you. Yeah, it's it. Uh, the, basically, the only people who still call it the Broadreach are the elves who live in there. Everyone else has taken to calling it the Hornsaw. Yeah, uh -huh. and um, well, when we're done with this experience, I'll explain a little more about that for the viewers and stuff. Yeah, that was it. I am 100% okay. for that. Yeah. Perfect. Um, the the broad reach uh, is corrupted by the heart of Mormo. It was buried there, and basically, it is turning this it is turning the broad reach into the horn saw, making it twisted, dying off, and um, turning these animals into monsters, and bringing in undead and other things that have forced the um, Broadway Gels to, to start moving out of the depths of the forest and into the edges of the forest. There's only like one or two clans who still live there, and I think it's um, Wolf and Fox, if I recall correctly, um, of which Yine is, is originally a fox. So, um, Birdie, if you don't mind, uh, I would say that Yene might have kind of a PTSD response to Seeker Pajat um, mm -hmm. when they find out that Pajat has connections to Mormo. Not necessarily. I say Mormo? Yes. You, then, well, you said Vangal and then. Um, Mezos. Oh, okay. Not the first of the dead. Oh. Even so, they've got a, a very vested interest in, uh, I mean, how common is the knowledge that Mormo's heart is in the wood? Is that like a thing of folklore that you could find out? And yeah, so 
most people kind of view it as uh, more more fairy tale than actually true. It's, you know, it's like, oh, yep, that used to be a beautiful forest until the heart of Mormon was buried there. You know, people not thinking a physical, literal heart is buried. Whereas Yene and their people think, no, the there are actual pieces of Mormo still out in the world, which uh, the group actually did find one and then gave it to Bellsmith. But their people think, no, somewhere in this forest, at who knows where, the actual heart is actually buried here. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a metaphor. It's real. Well, somebody should obviously dig that up. <laughs> Perfectly good heart sitting right there in the dirt. Sprout red trees. light splash. Red alert. Red alert. <laughs> yeah. But I wouldn't say that that experience would necessarily be negative or positive. It would be kind of a neutral thing where where you may may like the person, but they bring up bad memories. Um, and and someone like Mormo is also the reason why Broadridge elves don't sleep like normal elves. They have nightmares regardless of what happens to them. So huh. if I have to roll a d20 and if it's a one or a two, I do not regain certain things you'd get from a normal long rest. Youch. Yeah. That's rough. Yeah, the horns, like like I said, a horn saw doesn't mess around. It is a real bad place. Well, now, did we run into one another in the horn saw then? Oh, yeah. If you were looking for, for Mormo's heart, it'd be like, oh, shit. <laughs> Probably not looking be. for Momo's heart. That's that would be more of like a lifelong endeavor. Like that mm -hmm. would be like I am looking for that. That I'm just going to spend the rest of my life wandering this forest, you know, randomly digging stuff up. No, but out on the outskirts, of, uh, looking for that sort of information, absolutely. Yeah. And if by happenstance you find out that they are marked by one of the titans, I yeah, think that, that would, would make terrifying. for a perfectly unpleasant experience. <laughs> A delightfully undelightful experience. Yeah, because otherwise, um, from what I've heard of Seeker Pashat, uh, Yene really wouldn't have an issue because Yene You might not like them tons. because they're going to be kind of a bitch. I mean, Yene's friends with Lamalthoon, so... <laughs> got a point. <laughs> We've got a mutual friend that neither of us like. <laughs> Kind of knees. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think our group is pretty well bonded, uh, unless anyone had a last minute one they want to throw in there. I wanted to pitch uh, a general question, and that's how amenable sure. is your character to receiving a written contract and abiding by it? I think particularly with Gar as a means of conflict resolution, uh, Pajat would almost certainly just pin out like a, here's the terms and conditions of our being together and then hand that over and be like, if you agree to this, then we will not have any problems. You will not do this, this, or this. I will not do this, this, or this. <laughs> That's your greeting to me. I like yep. it. <laughs> or, you know, shortly after you raise some grievances for the merciless slaughter. To say, uh, so, is, is how amenable is Gar to agreeing to something I, to a pseudo Titan worshiper, but not really a worshiper? I, just I was like say, really into I Titan the stuff. The perfect timing, the perfect timing for this would have been you encounter Gar on his off time when he's totally not drunk, totally not been drinking, <laughs> totally not what? Okay, uh, so our bond is I sucker you into a contract. Uh, Paperwork. I've been doing this ever since I started helping these people out. Uh, here <laughs> you go. Sign off and hand Signature. Back. There we go. And then you okay. give me the. Then you give me the copy a couple days later, and I'm reading through it sober. What the fuck is this? <laughs> but I'll abide by most of it because I still signed it. Hey, how I'll draft up those contract. terms. I like it. All right. <laughs> Uh, one of the other questions I had, but I think just through making these bonds, uh, this is what I'm getting at least, is 
uh, Yane probably would have made the initial introductions of uh, Sienna to the rest of you. And then Lamalthoon, traveling back, would have made the initial introductions of uh, Seeker Pajat to the rest of you as well. I think that's kind of how the timeline is looking to be uh, based on everything you guys said. I think so. Okay. So we're almost done with our, with our session zero. I know it's coming to an end. So we're going to try something a little experimental. Uh, I was just kind of sitting around going, how do I have them have their first experience without it being a very boring dungeon crawl? Met in the uh, tavern. Yeah, or yeah, or everyone meets at the tavern. Um, we're going to have that very boring dungeon crawl. However, we're going to do it in, the, in this session. It's going to be done because in the world, it's already happened. You guys have already gone through this dungeon. You've looted it. You've won. You beat up the monsters that were in there, and you found the, the awesome loots that were in there. You're going to tell me how that went. You're going to tell me the monsters you guys fought together. You're going to tell me the traps you overcame and the puzzles you solved and the hidden rooms you found and things like that. And, uh, you know, I'm going to roll some loot for you guys so you guys will get some loot, and it's going to be... You guys, so you guys are going to tell me how it went, and then, you know, as long as it's not ridiculous, I'll sign off on it. So, working together, how did your first dungeon crawl go? I will say, this is how this this quest of yours started. Uh, Lamalthoon would have come to the rest of you, having finally everyone has gathered back in Erlesian. Lamalthoon would have come to you, letting you know that... Uh, he threw, you know, through the grapevine, through some informant of somebody talking to somebody else and talking to somebody else. Uh, there is this forgotten uh, temple out in the blood steps that has been buried, lost to time, was destroyed during the Divine War, but uh, he has found an entrance to it and that there is some sort of unknown power there that uh, the, all, the rest of you can either harness for yourselves or at least secure so it does not fall into the wrong hands. Especially since we already know that Mormo worshippers seem to be in this area. Any lead on any sort of powerful item should be followed up on. Do I trust you all agree? Perhaps we'd get to see Belsimeth again. I would like to bring Belsimeth. that crone up. Did you say uh, she... see Belsimeth? Oh, yes, yes, uh, we met Belsameth. Belsameth is kind of you amazing. You spoke with the Lady of Whispers. Oh, yes, and I saw her as well in her temple. This could be beneficial. It must have been an honor. It was. <clears throat> yes, to, to both of you, one of the drawing factors of the city of, of Orlesian is the fact that they do have an open temple to Belsameth. It's not some secret hidden away, like, hey, you know, here's the passcode to get into this guy's house so you can worship <laughs> Belsameth. It's just on the street next to the other temples to the to the goddesses of the Pantheon. The sausage was underspiced. Booze was pretty good, though. <laughs> I would be very honest. <laughs> Patty is like, I don't get no, it. It's going on right now. Okay, it was a, it so, was a big so, beer and sausage like festival. Like, I, 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 I specifically, I specifically, a very took attractive. It. Yes, a very attractive woman was offering uh, free free beer and food and uh, a busty well, wench. Yes, and oh, uh, some Susa, of our party could not help themselves. Susa didn't even wait. But uh, do they call this bloomers or look for this? <laughs> <laughs> I just got that. <sighs> Session zero, many more to come. Here are my terms up front it doesn't matter who it comes from in the party, but it has to come from somebody. Any person I kill three gold pieces for me. That's the bounty. Forgoing any other claims except the material. The killer has rights to the corpse. I will attempt to be merciful, as stipulated in the contract. Really In exchange, that. In exchange so, yeah. I will watch after your health. 
You want the gold and the corpse. The gold is for the corpse. You are familiar with the right? Two coins over the eye. One for me. I I could uh, butcher the bodies for you if you would like. I know how to do such a thing. Do not touch them. <clears throat> oh. Okay. Work it out with the group for your burial rites. As long as there is bloodshed, I care not for gold. Very well. Then you will pay me. Oh, wait. But I did not agree to pay you. <laughs> uh, wait, nope. hold See, on. <laughs> this it's, it's, this has gone horribly wrong. Then it's, then it's agreed Sayana will pay Seeker for their, for their kills. Excellent. <laughs> Let us carry on. <laughs> oh, God. No, it's okay. <laughs> Poor, poor summer child Sayana. <laughs> yeah, you just got bamboozled. <laughs> I think, keeping yeah. to the terms, I would I would not make an effort to kill anything unless it threatened my own life, but would tend to other people's wounds, at least throughout this dungeon. You know, we'll keep watch. Uh, we'll provide fire support. I'm not going to put my life on the line for you people. So... Uh... So you guys are going to head to the dungeon underneath the Terms of Seeker. Uh, there was a donation way early in the session for a role in the Major Chaos Table. Um, so I have chaos done that. Chaos Table, you say? Oh my. Yes. And uh, we got two players will swap characters for this dungeon. So oh. I'm going to have Yane and Lamalthoon Swap. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> so you is playing Yane, and Ever is playing Malthoon. Have oh at it. Um, oh, this is fuck. such a gift. I was legitimately not ready for that. Oh god. I know you weren't. That's okay. why I sprung it on you like this. <laughs> oh, I really wish you were here so we could swap wigs. Oh my god, that would be <laughs> That would be great. <laughs> That would be funny, so. Uh, okay. All right. Well, are we ready to con continue on then? All affairs in order, all contracts signed? I've been waiting for you all to be done so we could continue. You're taking way too long. I suppose if we must, I mean... Patience is a virtue, Elv. <sighs> That's We're interesting not getting any coming... It's interesting coming from a being with such a short lifespan. Are we going to get into this here? No, oh, no. Let us carry on into the dungeon. Seeker's placidly standing and staring until everybody else has gone in. Devok does just about the same thing, and then when Seeker doesn't move, he, he just Spring looks contest. over. He just he just looks over, nods, and walks in. <laughs> like and okay, you're kind of kind of doing the same thing I am. All right, uh, <laughs> keep eyes on everyone. The actual character Lemalthoon, not ever currently being Lemalthoon. Yeah. Oh. Uh, as the new rogue, are you a trap-finding rogue, or are you still just stabby? Are you asking, do I have a high perception? Are, are you the kind of rogue that finds traps now, or are you... Uh, am, I, am, I stand, am I walking in ahead of everyone and getting hit by traps he's, and such he's now, asking, or are I, you I, going to do roguey bits? Uh, he's asking if you're going to scout. In character, hold on. What is it? Sleight of hand that's needed. That's to disarm a trap. That's to disarm. Yeah. Perception investigation. or investigation yeah. would be needed to find them. Okay. Or, uh, or if name. it's a magically based trap, it would be an arcana check. Yane has plus seven to perception and plus eight to sleight of hand. But also can scout because stealth of plus 11. Not bad. 
You know, taking ever, up the front. Uh, ever check your no. name. But anyway, the main point is, if uh, we didn't have an actual scouting rogue, uh, oh. then uh, I'd be in first. Perhaps the scout should act as the scout going forward. They have grown up enough to contribute. What do you think, child? <laughs> uh, no, I, I, yeah, I, I'm a really good scout. I, I'll scout. I'll take point. So, Absolutely. do it. Go on. Damn. Don't, Don't just tell me what to do. I said I'd do it. You got. You got to be careful with that edge, the mouth, and Jesus Christ. You know what? Now I'm okay. not gonna. <laughs> so reluctantly, Yunay would scout ahead. <laughs> uh, as a group, uh, you know, are there traps to the entrance of this dungeon? Are there not? Does Yunay successfully find them? Did they successfully disarm them? Are all of you filled with poison needles? Mm, How many poison, poison needles, needles am I pulling out of all of you? <laughs> Is there a cactar in the dungeon filling you full of thousand needles? <laughs> One thousand needles. What um, what's your perception at currently? Uh, you, uh, scrolly scroll. Perception is a plus seven. Okay. I'm going to say, uh, whatever this, like, first section that we're in, kind of like the getting from town maybe to the entrance, um, their scouting goes really well. This is above ground, it's in a terrain that they're familiar with, having already been to the blood steps. Uh, once is an adventure, maybe they, uh, they see a, a bandit post, like, just like, you know, whatever preliminary dangers they get they, they show really good scouting abilities in this section for the plus seven yeah sure yeah absolutely all right so you all successfully enter into your dungeon um is everyone able to see down here i i can i'm assuming you have dark vision <laughs> you glance behind yourself you just see these big golden eyes in the dark <laughs> <clears throat> Sayana's skin is just faintly glowing purple. <laughs> uh, that may inhibit our ability to stay hidden. It is very faint. Like, it's it's not even, like, gives off enough light to be considered dim light. Like, it's... Uh, it doesn't, like... Uh, um, you know uh, when a glow stick's, like, about to die, but it hasn't yeah. yet? Mm. Mechanic, that's what I was looking for. Mechanically, it, do, it would not, it doesn't affect their stealth rolls or anything like that. Or, or when you crack I like that glow stick comparison. Yeah, yeah you, that was perfect, actually. Sayana's so our and, little glow stick. <laughs> I think it'd be Gars. pretty tasty if, just by the age and by having an exposed door, the front part of the temple was relatively safe. Mm -hmm. All the juicy stuff is behind the worship area and the secret catacombs. And so it's when we're heading into the cathedral or the the central part of the temple that we get ambushed from behind. Okay, what kind of enemies are down here in this temple? You have, you can, this could be a, uh, you This know, is the temple to uh, Just, I'm not, not even sure. There's no like significant markings here. Uh, it's just a general Titan worshiper temple. Um, so this could be, there could be uh, unredeemed Asafi here, there could be just Titan spawn here, there could be... This is the blood step, right? I, I yes. know there's one perfectly smooth room. Perfectly smooth? Perfectly smooth. It's our, in, it's our basic statement of there is a gelatinous cube here. Fuck you. Uh, <laughs> that would be nasty. Per Perfectly, cl perfectly clean. No, no dust. No. This no is a, a temple to Kadem, the Earth okay. Shaker. We get inside a little bit, and it shakes. And something, you know, from an upper chamber, something from another floor, just comes in like Kool Aid Man through the fucking wall, and starts chasing <laughs> us down. I like it. Oh, yeah. I like it. Hey. No. No. <laughs> Absolutely. Probably Titan uh, spawn. Ooh, yeah. Some big, hulking, horrible thing. 
Uh, let's say there is. What could there be? I'm gonna look through the creature manual real quick. Sam uh, is pretty broad, right? Pretty tough looking, heavily armored. Uh, they are literally just a floating, like floating armor, basically. Just a so, suit of armor. You said yeah. to who? Sorry. Sionna, I was asking. No, no, no the the what? Titan. Oh. To Kadem. Kadem. Kadem's the one that's chained up on the bottom of the Blood Sea right now. Mm-hmm. Got it. There he is. All muscle. So a bloody gelatinous cube, a congealed no. cube, if you will. Oh, I hate that. Oh, that's that's really. You're good, welcome. <laughs> there are creatures so called blood mings. So, the entire room is very, very clean. It's just dyed different shades of red. <laughs> like, it's the same thing, except just like, oh, that's light red. No, that's pink. Um, <laughs> and then just all, like, hey, there's some maroon over there. Oh, that's okay. terrible. All right, so I like I the gelatinous think... cube idea. So, yeah, you, all a... slay, you all successfully slayed the gelatinous cube. And inside of the gelatinous cube were the remains of several other adventurers who had previously tried to come here, meaning there's dank loot. Can I get like a sample just in a little file oh, of that sure. cubus? Sweet. One. Uh, yeah, yes, I have your uh, sample right here. And he's going to like, do you have a vial? It's literally burning a hole in your hands. Pulls out yeah, four. He, he's like, he's <laughs> grabs some vials and quickly tr- rakes it off of his armor because he was half submerged in the cube. <laughs> <laughs> and like gives it back. His arm's still a little smoking a little bit. It's very gently, very thoroughly cleans it, caps it right onto the belt. Inside of the gelatinous cube is an immovable rod. How did it come after us? <laughs> uh, it is not activated. Uh, what if that's how Devook stopped it? Reached in and click. <laughs> that would be a legitimate, uh, uh, legitimate thing. And then when the cube, uh, whenever the cube started moving, uh, also there was a damage. There was a staff of charming in there. Ooh. That's some dank loot. That's sexy. All right. So you successfully slay the gelatinous cube. Seeker is taking their uh, sample. Uh, the rest of you kind of pick through the rest of that oozy jelly that's left behind and pick up the rod and the staff, which, because they are magical, have remained pristine and undamaged, even though it is highly uh, acidic. Uh, and just kind of as you're collecting, you're taking your breath and uh, getting ready to move further. Uh, like Birdie said, there is a rumbling and a crash. The wall is nearly torn down as crashing through is a spawn of Kadem. A flayed giant crashes through. And I will uh, give you a picture of what it looks like in the, uh, in, the in the Discord chat. Ooh, I hate it. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't actually. Can I? I, I don't know. Uh, for the uh, for the viewers, it is it is a giant. Uh, I'll uh, send it one, to them. One of the giants. Perfect. One of the giants. Folk that is uh, red skinned and uh, looks like this creature is definitely meant to be in water. So its skin is actually very dried out, and uh, several pieces of it are kind of like crusty and falling off. And it looks like it's just had this tortured, miserable experience being the being the guardian of this temple. Uh, but uh, it, it has a sense to intruders and is therefore attempting to bring you your doom. Who gets the killing blow on the flayed giant? I feel like Devok definitely wants to. And so it... Obviously, he, has to be, you know. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. So, like, he he definitely wants to, and he's like, he's he's really feeling it, right? He's got his two axes in one hand. He chucks one of them, sticks right in their chest, jumps up, takes another slashing blow with his axe, and then just proceeds to eat eat dirt when he comes down. And the oh, like, man. the giant the giant with the pike is just sitting right there with a the trident, just ready to fucking end him. Air out of the forehead. Gar. Gar sitting there to make sure that you are safe because Gar is sitting there taking the heat as the uh, tanky bit the whole time. As they're all trying to damage it, Gar is the one who is in the forefront getting smashed on the entire time. <clears throat> his adamantium armor. <clears throat> I dig it. Uh, as the uh, as uh, as the creature falls, the uh, trident it was using to attack shrinks down to normal size as opposed to giant size, and it uh, was a trident of fish command. That's pretty cool. Also, uh, on, on its neck was a uh, set of uh, looks to be prayer beads, even though they are initially t- designed to be to Kadem. Uh, with a little bit of uh, holy work, uh, they could be cleansed of Titan influence and become neutral prayer beads. And you find a necklace of prayer beads that has... That has four beads on it. (coughs) All right. What else does this temple have in store for for you? That thing crashing through the wall definitely has to reveal the way forward. Oh, yes. Yes. Absolutely. Take a step back through, you know. We see where it came from, and it is so much worse down there. So we... We definitely, we move through the tunnel that this thing created, go through a couple of more chambers, and it leads a little bit down. We get to another room, um, a smaller kind of connective room. Um, it's, it sort of seems to be a hub between two sections. And when the last person comes through, uh, a, a, tri- uh, a lever's tripped somewhere in the floor, and it seals the room off completely. From the ground, blood starts to well. And I'm going to mix two things together and see how this goes. Um, and, um... Sorry, Tony. Not sure what happened. <laughs> um, as, it, as it wells up, the... Blood Man appears. It's just this uh, humanoid form of dripping blood. It's not quite congealed together enough to be um, that dangerous. And with six of us, we take it out fairly quickly. But when it breaks apart, enough of its blood separates and goes into different vents on either side of the room. And as these hidden chambers fill with the blood of the blood man, we hear some mechanism behind the walls turns. And now blood starts pouring in from the top. Ah, uh, the uh, the creature to slay was the actual trap. Yes. I like it. So we are now stuck in this small, smaller than usual dungeon room as it is rapidly filling with cursed blood. Ooh. And uh, that, of course, make blood is very, you know, blood is thicker than water. Yes. Uh, so it'd be very hard to move through. Much harder than you is, you know, even trying to move through water. Definitely be making your athletics uh, to tread at disadvantage. Oh, yeah. And uh, like, like you said, cursed blood. So there'd also be diseases and poisons that you're trying to resist. Yes. Um, 
The door that shut behind us, that was solid wall. And there are there are these grates. Is there a grate forward? Is there like a an obvious mechanism that's behind something? Ooh, yeah, with the with the with the mechanism in the system, remember the, the blood's pouring in from the top, so that must connect to something. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like it. I like it. Here's what I'm thinking. Um, after, you know, standing there under it, just having it spatter all over them for a minute, Pajat puts together uh, the way that it must be doing this. And then you get to see them use magic probably exactly once. They raise out their hand, rake their hands across their skin, and then come apart into a cloud of blood uh, using Misty Step to appear you know, 30 feet up and disarm the mechanism. Yeah, like Isn't they described, all... it's it's not your usual Misty Step, where it's just kind of like, uh, think like Star Trek uh, teleporter, where it just kind of phase out of existence <laughs> and reappear. Like it's like they said, an explosion of blood and almost this mist of fine red particulate moves, and you can see it physically moving from one place to another. Okay, I like that. Gar would hate it. <laughs> Why do you have to explode yourself in order to move? That is an oversimplification of the process. You are asking me for a thesis of magic. I am trying to disarm a trap. Reconsider this. Yes. Whatever is more drink. sufficient, as long as you don't get any of it on me. You are wet up to your waist. Yes, well, at least this part could be consensual. Can we please leave? Can we please leave? <laughs> I, think, I, think I, I think I found a loose stone that I'd be able to, we can remove and, and crawl through to the next area. And pulls out one of the stones that maybe didn't have quite as much mortar and we bust through into the next area. Shield bash shit. Absolutely. Working together, able to move that loose stone while uh, Seeker had helped with the uh, stopping of the flow of blood long enough for all of you to narrowly escape into the next room. By the way, uh, out of be... character, um, Seeker Pashat got a um, crit success uh, in our... Charity, but uh, from Zachary. It's from Zach. Wow, that was weird to say, Zachary. Oh, thanks. Yeah, awesome. Birdie gets a crit for playing a big kitty person. <laughs> yeah. I will say uh, we can hold on to that until uh, next week. Um, to, Writing down to, to get, that I have to get an, to get an actual 20. use out of that, as uh, you kind of all are just automatically succeeding tonight. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll hold on to that where this, there are stakes. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I, I I hate to be that guy. Does anyone have any spell that can get the blood out of my teeth? That'd be great. Out of your it's teeth? The toothbrush. You drink it. Uh, oh good. Okay. Uh, Just do swallow. I have, uh, all right. I'll be a little bit more literal here. Okay. I am covered in blood. I yes. would like to not be. Come oh. here. Surviving okay. in the woods on game for quite a while, I would not recommend oh, drinking Jesus. blood from an unknown source. We know where it came from. Okay, again, we are being we way know the too blood. fucking literal. Okay, all right. um, Up is not a source. It's a direction. Let, them, let okay. them make their own mistakes, child. In the back end of the, the party, I would go through the motions of just very, very quietly... Uh, stripping the blood off of Devok with prestidigitation. It's not a pleasant experience, Devok, as it's, once again, it's not like the instant cleaning where, you know, Seeker would, like, wiggle their nose and then, like, I right. dream a genie, it's just gone. It's, like, you feel it physically, like, peeling off of you. Like, uh, how you peel off, like, nail yeah, polish like, or a temporary tattoo. Like, it's, yeah. like, it's just, it's been clinging to you and just, like... You feel the skin come up just a little bit with yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, Devok Dev- would feel it that. Hurt, it, but it's not pleasant. Yeah, Devok Dev- would feel that and, like, 
I, I feel like a little bit would come off his spine and it would cause like cold chills and he'd just be like mm. and and then he's like he'd look at himself and be like, Well I can okay. hardly uh I, I can hardly argue with results, thank you. Seeker, did you get a sample? It is tainted. Fair enough. And also and Gar will very coagulated. Yeah. Gar will pull out his magic uh, mug, hand it to the Duvok, and say, Small drink, we're busy at work, but we should get that shit out of your mouth, man. Uh, it, it, yeah, so it was more. Um, he takes it, he takes it, <clears throat> and, he go, and, he, and he takes a drink, and he goes, It, it was more uh, just wanting to be clean than anything else. Uh, but yeah, you're yeah, well, okay. All right. It's an excuse to drink. I'm. No, no, fair, fair. I mean, it's just we're all being... Not me. I, I feel like there's a bunch of really smart people in here, and the whole, like, literalness of everything is just going... Okay, all right, let's move on here. Okay. So you successfully get out of the blood trap. What's next, adventures? We will know in just a few seconds... <laughs> As I believe it's probably time to be entering the final encounter of the dungeon. Just about. You come across giant cathedral doors that very obviously lead to the final inner sanctum of this long forgotten temple. The doors are ornate. There are depictions of just about every titan carved into them. But at the bottom of the doors, so at eye height, is the depiction of a giant of waves and the sea and ships bobbing along it and the accurate, perfectly portrayed carving of... Oh, perfect. Of Kadem. With, you would think, and while the chains and the scars and the and the injuries are freshly, fleeing, freely pouring blood into the sea, you see that the artist decided to to depict a smile on his face. What we also see, as voted by chat, I'm going to flavor this up a little bit. Is a nine to six, nine by to the way. Six, an amazingly close nice, vote. Nice, 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 nice. Is a single person alone in front of the altar, finishing the last sentences of his incantation. What we thought at first would be a blood magus sips drinks, gulps deeply from the chalice, wipes blood from his mouth, and immediately starts to bleed from all of his pores and erupts into a golem made purely of blood. Unlike the blood man from before that could barely hold form, this is a ten foot tall, congealed but flowing creature. and it's coming for us. And even in this room with its large vaulted ceilings uh, showing, you know, up, you know, high enough that all the voices that would be chanting in here normally would not be uh, too loud, this golem still seems to have to hunch its shoulders as it approaches all of you. And you make battle! <clears throat> all right, tell me, who falls in battle? Who uh, lands the killing blow and uh, and any other significant events that might have happened in this big boss battle? Out of curiosity, does anyone in the party have a resurrection spell? Uh, you should, Claire. Um, well, if I die, I can't use it. Yeah, so... You know. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay, never I like mind. where your head's at. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is resurrection believe... available at level six? I shall charge. Uh, yeah, Not resurrection. Day. Yeah, it'd be raised. Revivify. Day. Revivify. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. No. Yeah. I, Lamalthun, um, shall rush it and go down in a glorious blaze of battle. <laughs> okay, Lamalthun, eager to show off his new skills and pit them against a formidable enemy would use and you all see 
uh, instead of necessarily drawing uh, the two swords that they would usually, to the two rapiers they usually use, you see in their main hand, they actually just kind of clench their fist and a jagged sword forms around it and they would use it and it would constantly be reappearing and disappearing as they fight. And any time that uh, he would successfully land a blow against this creature, instead of it recoiling from being stabbed, you'd see it actually shriek out in pain as it seems to have this mental assault happening to it. Yine would... draws Yine their bow. Lamalthun? Yine draws their bow, um, goes back to a covered position, and starts range stabbing. <laughs> And a formidable amount of range stabbing it is. It seems that every arrow that lands seems to find purchase in the perfect spot, right where the ebb and as, because this is not stationary blood, this is flowing blood that has collected itself into this golem. So in the ebb and flow, it seems to find purchase in the perfect spots in this golem. Not only that, but each, some of the arrows seem to, it must be a trick of the eye. Some of them seem to split into several arrows and all hit the creature at once, or erupt a, a blanket of thorns that wraps around the creature. Car would run headlong in next to Lamalthun, making sure that his friend did not perish as he's so prone to doing. Uh, attacking with the Divine Smite, and eventually when someone lands Smite. a seeming seemingly critical blow on uh, one of our comrades uh, get angry and uh, cast uh, Rebuke the Violent to uh, return that damage done to my compatriot back radiantly. So yes, uh, Gar moving in like the legionaries of old would carefully maneuver the spear behind his uh, shield, taking careful and measured stabs at the creature. Every now and then when the spear lands, detonating in radiant light, washing over a completely uh, boiling momentarily portions of the creature's blood. Every now and then reaching over to Lamalthun, invigorating him, giving him a little bit more energy to continue fighting. And right when Lamalthun seems to be going down, the, the 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 arm that slams down on him seems to just almost recoil, rewinding in time, it seems, as another detonation of radiant light comes off and washes over the creature. Sayana uh, would also run... Oh, go ahead. No, you're good. Sayana would also fight alongside Malthoon and Gar. Um, she'd brace her shield and her battle axe and try hacking away at the limbs of this golem trying to dismember it as Van Gaal did to the Titans many years ago. Um, she would actually be hoping that Malthoon would fall in battle so she could raise him and let him know that it was Van Gaal's power that brought him back to life. <laughs> yes, and where Sayana <laughs> finds purchase, where guards, where Gar finds purchase, detonations of radiant light goes off, where Sayana finds purchase, the blood seems to recoil, coagulate, and harden, and turn into this brownish uh, 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 form of blood, like it, the cells in it are dying, as the necrotic energy seeps and flows out of her axe into the creature. Uh, for Devok, it's going to be very simple. He has axes. He's going to ask questions. Um, Plural? Yes, he has two hand axes. Perfect, perfect. You're going to get a gentle hand on the back and a rake of the claws down that spine that shivered earlier. And it's going to coil forward onto your axes and enchant them with magic weapon. I'll be back here. Like a whirling Badass. dervish, Devoke moves forward, and where he had normal, he had originally normal axes, they are actually, the pommels start to be wrapped in his own blood, and they trace down, not unlike veins in your body, up to the blades of the axes that seem to then shimmer slightly with this darkish, green, blackish energy. And your strikes on this golem seem to find even more damage and purchase. And it's just whirling, hacking. He's on, he's, you, you can't even see him as he strikes over and over again. Every now and then, there's a 
there's a uh, 180 turn and a blast of fire comes out of his hand. Can you nay do one more thing? Absolutely. You're a ranger, right? Indeed, I am level four ranger, level two rogue. Okay, then... Yane is going to pull from their pouch something that they've had f- for a little while, uh, especially traveling back to the Broadreach. Um, a small amount of powder that they pour over a, one of their arrowheads and shoots into the uh, the blood creature. And they have coated an arrowhead with snake with powderized snake venom. Nice. Um, the specifically the type that causes extra coagulation, um, and has now has put that into the creature. And then the seeker, after enchanting Devok's axes, what else? What else would uh, uh, Pazak be doing? I'm given to understand that this thing can still see in some form, right? Yes. And it's tall. Obviously, we should limit that. And seeing as nobody here is 20 feet tall, I'm going to place a globe of darkness on the ceiling such that every time it rears back its head, it loses sight of everybody else. And then just gently stand there, bending the blood in Yane's veins to aim those shots a little bit more accurately with guidance. The seeker flits around the battlefield moving from each of you, just whispering a, a word in one of your ears or a rack down the back for another one of you. And just is, there's darkness erupting from their hands at one point. There's uh, a chill down each of your spines as a shot that might've missed that you thought was going to miss seems to find its mark. And with the combination of all of your efforts together, you bring down this blood golem. It crashes down, washes blood over all over you guys again. You had just been cleansed of it, but it, it comes back all over you again. And then you look around and there's more loot to be found as it seems Lamalthun's contact was correct. There is an, a scene behind uh, the altar, behind a panel that once again depicts uh, Kadem and uh, alongside Kadem, Golthaga, the Titan that uh, was the first smith. Uh, There is a rack of weapons. There is a spear that seems to have a shield integrated into it. There is a longbow. There is a rapier. There is a battle axe. There is a gauntlet that seems to have slits at the end of it for knives or daggers or maybe a claw if someone had one of those. And a hand axe that upon when you pick it up to evoke, it splits into two and then comes back together as one. Each of you holds the corresponding weapon that you naturally are gravitate towards and pick, and you can feel there is immense power in these weapons. And that's where we'll leave off. A successful session zero, a successful dungeon crawled, a successful loot gained, and uh, ready to re-enter the world of Skarn and uh, see what lies before you in season two of Flame to Whimsy. So, it's been a pleasure getting everyone reacquainted with all of you and introducing our two new characters. Well, I'm and we hope you dance. <laughs> and we hope you, the audience, enjoyed getting to know our characters again. Uh, if you are uh, veterans of season one or being introduced to them if you are brand new here. Uh, I'd like to once again thank Onyx Path Publishing, Ashley Tabletop, and Vinswept. Special shout out goes to all of our Patreon subscribers, our Twitch subscribers, and to you, lovely audience, for joining us on this wonderful trip through the Scarred Lands. Don't forget to follow and subscribe to us on Twitch. Remember, you can always use your free sub you get with Amazon. Check out our works on GM's Guild and Drive Through RPG. Get some bodacious merch on our merch store. 
and join our Discord to become part of the best community on the internet. And finally, to love one another. Let's hear from our players now. Once again, your name, handle, character, and where people can find you outside of Warped Tales. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Steve. You can find me on the internet at Voodoo Arcade. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Tonight, I mostly played with Malthoon, but for a little bit, I played Yane, which was great. And next, you will find me on Sunday playing Nora the La Sombra um, Vampire in Starlight and Smoke, which is great. Um, I'm sure I will be very angry at my group of vampires. Yeah, that's what I'm going to go with. All right, and I am J3 Billion, otherwise known as John. Uh, I have been Devok tonight, our eldritch knight with hell yeah, badass axes. Fuck yes. Oh, I'm so excited for that loot. A um, little bit, little bit too excited, maybe. Uh, but the next time you're going to see me is going to be tomorrow for Werewolf the Apocalypse. Uh, that's going to be uh, at 8 o'clock right here on Vertical Tales. And uh, one quick thing uh, before I go is we did reach our hundred dollar goal for tonight so i'm gonna be ordering some uh, order ordering some hair product i like it you're gonna look good in green i think thank you i'll, I'll have to talk with some of the people and be like maybe i can get some green and red you know so it's a little bit of work. contrast i think yeah i think i think that'd be good dm me afterward i got brand recommendations i change my color all the time oh will do Speaking of, I'm Beatrice. My friends call me Birdie, and you can find me here next week. Had to find the unmute button. Hey, y'all. My name is Keens. You can find me on the interwebs at It's Me Keens. Um, tonight, I played the Hollow Legionnaire and Death Domain Cleric, much to Gar and Malfoon's chagrin, uh, Sayana. Um, I'll be back here next week doing it same, the same thing and throwing it right back at you guys. Hey everybody, I'm Ever, and you can find me all over the internet as Changeling Ever. My pronouns are they, them, until I decide that they're not. So there, you can't tell me otherwise. Anyway, uh, you can find me playing Sunday night as Billy, the hard of hearing and autistic vampire who... Um, is has taken a very disturbing turn um, following the path of Lilith, so we'll see how that goes. You can find me on Etsy at Neat and Co Designs, and I have enjoyed playing Yane and then my interpretation of Lil Malthoon for you all. It was fun. Which was probably more Lil Malthoon than Lil Malthoon, let's be fair. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty good. It was there was that not 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 that like not, nothing against Steve, but that had a lot more fucking edge than Malthine usually has. You gotta respect my... character chemistry. Y'all do each other well. <laughs> oh, um, <I'm... laughs> no, no comment on the way you worded that. <laughs> like, and finally, Devin. <laughs> Now that I'm coming in last. All right, I am Devin. You can find me online at Sorta of Sullied, and the next time you'll find me will be on Monday for uh, Delta Green. All righty, perfect. Uh, normally, this is where we would vote and uh, give each other compliments on our excellent characters, but I am going to vote. For all of you and say all of you get a vote so next session all of you get one uh re-roll of the d20 on any uh any d20 roll you need to so uh keep that in mind uh i also encourage all the listeners uh, and viewers uh besides the shows our wonderful cast mentioned uh to check out corporaltales.com see our most up-to-date calendars and check out all those shows uh, we got some great things coming uh, and that are going on currently, like Deadlands, Star Trek, uh, Ghost Hunters, uh, 
Chronicles of Darkness, Squeaks in the Deep. It's all kinds of greatness. You should check it out. But other than that, we hope you enjoyed our story tonight. We look forward to seeing you in the future on Fridays, 9 p.m., same time, same place, every week, uh, to continue the tale. Until next time, my Corian light your way. Stay safe, stay awesome, stay adventurous, make good choices, and wear a mask.